what is going on guys hello and welcome to my first ever black desert guide video today i'm going to be bringing you guys the ultimate captain node war guide and it's going to have all the information that you need in terms of buffs gear crystals and way more now before we move on guys i just want to mention that this video is not really meant to be watched in one sitting as it's actually pretty long so instead what i really recommend is skipping to the sections that you would like to learn about using the timestamps or the chapters. So, with that being said guys, let's get started with some buffs that you'll want to be using for every single node war. Alright guys, so pretty much the first buff that you want to have active for literally all forms of PvP is going to be the Exquisite Crown Meal. Uh, pretty much this food gives you every single stat that you need, you know, AP, Accuracy, Attack and Movement Speed, Critical Hit, Evasion, HP, Stamina, Back Attack, Critical Hit Damage, all resistance and ignore resistance. So make sure that you have this literally permanently active anytime you're in node war or any kind of battle arena or literally any kind of PvP whatsoever. So in terms of food buffs that we can run guys, I wasn't actually going to include this in the video, but just for completion's sake, we're gonna be talking about the four food rotation. So basically the four food rotation is something that you'd be using on T4 only or even uncapped. Now, of course you have the standard exquisite prawn meal, which we just spoke about. However, what we can do is we can also run something like a four food rotation. So again, if we use the special Odalita meal, the Camisylvia meal, the King of Jungle Hamburg meal, as well as the Valencia meal, and assuming you have the 120 minute versions of each of these foods, you can actually have it set so that way your fairy automatically uses these foods and if you pop these foods from about maybe an hour and a half before war minimum you can actually have a four food rotation in place now i'm going to link a graphic on the screen here that is pretty much going to show the differences between exquisite crown meal and the four food rotation but basically speaking what happens is you lose out on a couple of stats so for example on the capped edition of the four food rotation you lose out on 8 AP, 15 accuracy, 2 attack speed and casting speed, 2 movement speed, 2 crit, 5 evasion, and 1% ignore all resistance. Now, generally speaking, the 8 AP, 15 accuracy, 5 evasion, and 1% ignore all resistance are virtually worthless on capped content. You hit those stats pretty easily. So the big kicker of why we want to run a food rotation on T4 only is because again for T4, the special attack evasion rate is uncapped. And if you run a food rotation, so for example, if you run these foods right here, you actually gain five DR, but the most important thing is that you gain 5% special attack evasion rate. Now special attack evasion rate obviously is extremely, extremely good. It is the best tanky stat in the game essentially. So running this four food rotation, and if you do it properly, you actually gain 5% special attack evasion, which can even help you hit upwards of 50% special attack EVA. So absolutely massive. Now, the other thing that's important to note about this food rotation is that you do lose two attack speed and casting speed, and you lose two movement speed as well as two crit. So you have to make sure that you are going to be running Elixir of Shock, so right here, this is pretty much mandatory. This gives plus three crit. You are also going to need to run the critical hit house buff, which is, I believe, the special stuffed fox. And the special stuffed fox gives another plus three critical hit level. So in the event that you are not running spirit perfume elixir, which gives plus five, you 100% need to be running the elixir of shock for the plus three crit and you 100% need to be running the Fox Furniture buff as well to hit that 5 crit. As far as the attack speed or the casting speed are concerned, you can also choose to run the Elixir of Wind, which gives an additional 2 attack speed level, and you can also run the Elixir of Spells, which gives 2 casting level. So basically, as long as you hit 5 crit, which is very, very easy, and as long as you hit five attack speed and casting speed, which is also very, very important. The only thing you need to worry about is movement speed. And of course for movement speed, you're going to want to run the Elixir of Intrepid Swiftness for the plus three movement speed. And you will also want a movement
movement speed crystal and with all those things combined you should hit five casting speed or attack speed you should have five critical hit rate and you should have about four out of five movement speed maybe there's a way to get five movement speed if you know let me know down below in the comments but yeah so free rotation is pretty advanced if you want that extra five percent special attack evasion rate on t4 or uncapped you can run it otherwise for 99 percent of all other content you can just get away with running the exquisite crown meal and the next buff that you want to have active pretty much all the time as well is going to be the giant's draft yes it's actually pronounced draft <laughs> um this draft also gives you 10 ap uh 150 max hp extra special attack damage which is very very important pretty much that means that any down attack critical hit back attack or air attack are going to do 10 percent more bonus damage so that is extremely important to have for every single life for that reason alone to be honest with you you also get three movement speed three critical hit and another 200 stamina which is very very important especially for classes like sage another important thing to know guys is that if you are not using elixirs for t1 or t2 which you should be you want to actually drag your giant's draft onto your hotbar like this so for example i can put mine on the five key and every time you respawn on a fresh life you want to make sure that you hit that button so you have this active 24 7. make sure that this is up because again if you don't have it active you're missing out on a ton of potential damage the next thing that i would like to talk about is going to be the villa buff body enhancement basically what this is is it's pretty much a villa buff that you get that increases your stats for pvp content what i like to do is i like to buy from my tent I know that you can get a Villa Invitation as well and do it that way, but if you have a Secret Book of the Old Moon active on your account, you can basically buy Villa buffs from your tents without having to do that. It makes it much, much easier. Uh, so what we are going to do is we're going to open our tent here, we're going to go to Villa Scroll, and typically speaking, you can either buy the 180 minute buff or you can buy the 300 minute buff. I like to buy the 300 minute just because I'm lazy, and you can get this even as early as like you know, an hour or two hours before Node War and not have to worry about it. So we go here, we buy the uh, 300 minute villa, and boom, you can see we have it right here, plus 10 AP, plus 10 DP, a really nice 200 HP, 10% all resistance, and 5% ignore resistance. So really quite a good buff. It'll help you hit caps, you know, you get a little bit of extra res, a little bit of ignore res. Um, you definitely want to have this active for every single node war because again the stats are just way too good to pass up so make sure you get this somehow either from your tent with the uh, secret book of the old moon or you can just buy a villa invitation and uh, you won't need a book of the old moon but you really should have one because it makes it way easier also guys i would like to note that if you are trying to access your tent make sure that you get your tent before 10 minutes before node war actually starts so on the 50 minute mark the reason why this is is because around the 50 minute mark all tents are despawned and you actually cannot put down a tent in the node war server so in the event that occurs you'll have to swap to a non-node war server and then put your tent down and then swap back to the node war um, now with the new five minute server swap cooldown it's not too big of a deal but you might wind up being late from that so it's just something to note make sure that you get your villa buff anytime before the uh, xx50 marker for node war the next most important set of buffs that you're going to want to be running for every node war and every pvp session or even pve for that matter is of course going to be the church buffs so if we come over here to hyadel and we go to this npc named isle or eel whatever that guy's name is we're going to go to this npc named arson chat with him and pretty much 99.9 percent .9 of the time you're going to want to have both of these active all the time um, you want the attack buff, so we'll go and buy that. You also want the protection buff, so we'll also buy that. Experience doesn't really matter, and in my uh, in my experience, <laughs> this doesn't really give you too much anyway. So I wouldn't really worry about buying this even for PvE. And essentially what we have here is we get a free plus 8 AP. We get a free plus 8 accuracy. And we also get plus 8 DR, which is very important to hit caps and also 150 HP, which is also really, really good to hit caps. Now guys, with that being said, I should mention that if you are way over the T1 or T2 caps, whichever node war that you are currently doing, you actually don't even need to be running these. And the reason for that is because it's relatively easy to hit the AP cap as well as the accuracy cap. 
and typically speaking most people also hit DR cap. I would say if you're a newer player it might be more difficult to hit the DR cap, but if you're someone that has you know a decent chunk of gear and you're well over 600 or even 650 etc, you really don't even need to buy these. I would say you only buy this maybe if you want to do uh, extra damage outside of zone if it comes to that. But if you're over capped on node war and you have a lot of gear, you actually don't even need these. Um, so yeah. Pretty much the next set of buffs that we're going to have active 24-7 for every node war is going to be the alchemy stones. So, of course we have a couple of choices here. The first main choice is going to be the Vel's Heart. If you are a newer player, or if you don't have money to buy a Vel's Heart, you can always use the cheaper alternative, which is going to be a Destruction Spirit Stone. Pretty much there's not really a whole big difference between the Spirit Stone and the Vel's Heart. You're only really missing out on a couple of Ignore All Resistances, 2% uh, All Res, and a little bit more AP and accuracy and 1% attack speed. So it's really not that much of a loss. And if you're an offensive class, you want to be using one of these two. You also have the option of running Perilla Star. I personally do not prefer using this because it doesn't give attack speed, which is really, really valuable if you want to do more damage. However, it does give 1 HP per hit, which is not really that bad. It's pretty decent. And you also have 200 HP and 100 stamina. So this could be the difference between you hitting HP cap or not, which is not that bad. But I still personally prefer using Bells or Destruction Spirit Stone for the raw attack speed. Another important thing to know guys about the Alchemy Stones is that every buff that you get from the Alchemy Stone when you activate it lasts about 5 minutes and that consumes a charge from your Alchemy Stone. So if you want your stone to last the entirety of Node War, which is assuming 2 hours, you want to have at least 24 charges in total on your Alchemy Stone. Of course more is always better in case you forget, but make sure you have at least 24 so it doesn't run out in the middle of the war and cost you a lot of stats while it's down. Alright boys, so the next most important buff that we're going to be getting literally before every single node war, no exceptions whatsoever, is going to of course be the Carolyn Critical Hit Damage buff. Now, this is a buff that you can get in Hydel, of course from the NPC named Carolyn. And what you want to do is, it's pretty much right up here in Hydel, everybody knows where this is at. Um, in case you don't know, it's literally right up from where the uh, central market is on the road. You just go up the road, go through here, and walk up the stairs. And you're going to come through to Carolyn here. And what you need to do is you need to have a certain level of amity with her to even be able to access the critical hit buff. So for most people, what you can do is come up to her and just spam F5. And literally just do that until you have the option of purchasing her crit buff which of course costs a little bit of energy. It's only 25 energy, of course, everybody has that amount. So if you do not see this option, again, just come up to Carolyn and spam F5 over and over. You'll lose a little bit of energy doing this, but it doesn't matter because you get more uh, Amity with her and that'll allow you to buy the buff. And of course, guys, make sure you have this literally before every single node war, every battle arena session, every siege, basically any form of PvP or even PvE if you can because 10% critical hit damage is really, really huge in uh, any kind of node war. Another cool little hack, guys, that I should mention is that if you are doing node wars anywhere around the, let's say, Serendia region, uh, which there are quite a bit, so for example, the Northern Plain of Serendia is a popular T3, uh, if you have downtime before a fight, and you know your Carolyn buff is about to run out, you can literally just map back to town, you can map to Hydel, and you can quickly refresh your Carolyn buff before the rest of your fight goes on. Of course, it's very greedy, it's very min-max, but, I mean, could be the difference between you top-ragging or not, so always make sure that anytime you have the chance, if you have downtime during a war, go refresh your critical hit buff uh, as soon as possible. It's just way too good. The final buff that I want to talk about that you can pick up pretty much before every war is, of course, going to be your house buff. So, your house buff, you can pretty much have this installed in any kind of residence. For me, I like to have a little buff station right outside of Hydel. Uh, I'm sure like most people do, because it's really, really close. So, we go into your house. And now for T1 and T2, there's not a whole lot of choices that you can make, because most of all the steps are already capped. But, what you can do, and what I like to do personally, is I like to come over here and use my Calx Wings. Now, Calx Wings is a furniture buff that lasts for two hours, if I'm not mistaken. And as you can see, it gives you 200 stamina. Now, the reason why we grab this house buff is because every single other stat is capped. And if you are already hitting HP cap, which is not really that difficult, 
you don't need to be using the HP house buff. So instead, this is the only one that you can use, and this is going to be the best one for T1 and T2 specifically. So we're going to grab our calc buff, and then now guys, as you can see, we have a full loadout of buffs. We have our exquisite crown meal, we have our offensive church buff, we have our villa buff body enhancement, we have our defensive church buff, we have our carolyn critical hit damage buff, we also have our giant's draft, we have our alchemy stone, and then finally we have our house buff. Also guys, I would like to mention that if you need the calc wing buff for the stamina, you can either pre-order it from the central marketplace, or if you're unable to do that, you can come over here to the Guild Military Supply Manager. That's an NPC right next to the storage in Heidel. Talk to this NPC, go to Exchange, and you're gonna scroll down all the way to the bottom right here. And you can see that you can purchase various furniture buffs. Uh, of course, one of them being the Calx Wings that we want. So if for some reason you can't buy this from the market and you have 100 uh, Medals of Honor laying around, you can just buy this and have it for yourself whenever you need. It has 10 charges, so that's essentially 10 different mores, um, and it's really, really good. It's the best thing you can get for T1 and T2. Uh, you can also buy Elixir of Deep Seas if you want, and you can get Perfumes of Courage, of course, after the new patch, Perfume of Charms for uncapped only. You want to use those for uncapped. Uh, and then you can also buy Corrupt Oil of Immortality, which is what I personally like to do, especially for sieges. So, yeah, if you can't get it from the market, you can always come here and buy with some Medals of Honor. And the other house buff that I would like to talk about is, of course, going to be the HP house buff. Now, this one in particular is going to be the Master's Special Stuffed Shadow Wolf Head. And basically what this does is it pretty much gives you plus 100 HP for 3 hours, which is really, really good. Um, so all of your T3 and T4 and Sieges, you're going to want to be running this HP buff particularly. It lasts for the entirety of any standard node war, and it'll last for almost the entirety of a siege. So really, really good stuff. Make sure that you're using this all the time. You can also alternatively use this for T1 and T2 if you need the extra HP. Otherwise, this is the main go-to capped node war and siege house buff. The next consumable that I want to talk about that you should really be running pretty much whenever you get the chance is going to be the superior well tenon potion. Now this consumable is pretty important because essentially what you do is you want to drag it onto your hotbar, preferably on a button that you can actually hit really easily, and as soon as you press that button you're going to be healing for 750 HP instantly, and you heal for 45% more if you use it when you're CC'd. So what this means is that if you get knocked down in node war, or you get CC'd and you're about to die, you can just activate this and you're going to heal over 1000 HP instantly which, to be honest, in T1 and T2 node war, where damage is not terribly high, um, this is oftentimes the difference between you surviving a random combo or not. So these are really, really good. Um, you want to have them pretty much for almost every node war if you can help it. I would recommend about maybe like 30, give or take, 30 plus. And uh, yeah, use them all the time. Use them when you get CC'd. It'll save your life, and it's really, really good. Rounding out the end of the luxury buffs that you can use for node war, I do want to talk about the Miraculous Goop. Now, basically, this is pretty much a superior well tendon potion, but juiced up. As you can see, once you click this, you get 5,000 HP instantly. So, this is another buff that you want to drag onto your bar, preferably next to your well tendon pot. And the reason for this is because, let's say you get CC'd, or you want to do a hero play, and you know that you're going to die, but you're fully protected, and if you had just an extra heal, you would live. This is pretty much the consumable that's going to allow you to do one hero play per day, because it's on a 22 hour cooldown. And you instantly heal 5000 HP, which is quite a lot. Um, you know, it's like for most people, it's about half their HP bar, if not more. So, what you can do is, when you get CC'd, if you're in danger, or you want to make a hero play, you can pop this, and you can pop the uh, superior well and potion at the same time. And if you're CC'd, you're going to heal for over 6000 HP with these together. So. Again, use it wisely because it's only on a 22 hour cooldown, which is obviously pretty long. You know, it's literally one day, so you can only use this once a war, basically. Um, so use it wisely, it's really good, highly recommend it, and let me know if it works for you guys. Okay guys, so the next consumable that I would like to talk about is going to be the Miraculous Nourishing Soup. 
So the Miraculous Nourishing Soup is actually quite a good consumable and you're pretty much going to want to be using this for every single T3 specifically and Cap Siege. Now the reason for that is fairly obvious, as you can see, this buff gives you 200 additional maximum HP, it also gives you plus 100 maximum stamina, which is quite nice, and it lasts for 30 minutes. However, as you can tell, the cooldown is also 22 hours, much like the Miraculous Gook. So essentially you want to use this when you know that there's going to be a lot of fighting popping off, uh, you don't really want the stats to go to a waste. So this is the ideal Land of the Morning Light consumable that you can use for your T3 and Cap Siege. Again, do take note that it is once a day, so you have to make sure you use this properly. It's not really that impactful for T1 and T2 specifically, because again, HP is capped at such a low rate, and if you do use it, you'd be only using it for the plus 100 stamina, which I don't really think it's worth the money or the time using this only for stamina. So, best in stock consumable for T3 and Cap Siege, and you can use it along with your other food buffs and everything like that. It's really, really good. So the other Land of the Morning Light consumable that we're going to be talking about is of course going to be the Iridescent Maywa Liquor. Now the Iridescent Maywa Liquor is pretty much the alternative option to the Miraculous Nourishing Soup. However, you're only really going to want to use this on T4 and Uncapped Wars and Sieges. Now the reason for that being is that it gives plus 5 DR. Really again, you should hit DR caps pretty easily on T3 and Cap Siege. 5% all resistance, which is okay, but the big kicker is the 2% special attack evasion rate. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but on T4 specifically, special attack evasion rate is uncapped, and special attack evasion rate itself is a very, very powerful defensive stat, if not the best defensive stat in the whole game. So, you want to make sure that you have this for every single T4. It is going to be a little superior to the nourishing soup for the aforementioned reason of the special attack evasion rate. So uh, yeah, very, very good to have. Make sure that you use this. Otherwise, if you're doing T3, like I said earlier, you want to use the soup. If you're doing T4s, you want to make sure that you are using the Iridescent Maywa Liquor. This also stacks very, very nicely with the Untouchable Artifact setup, and it also stacks good with the Perfume of Charm for the additional 10% Special Attack Evasion Rate. Okay, so in terms of perfumes, pretty much the main perfume that you want to be running all the time is of course going to be the Spirit Perfume Elixir. It's actually perfume, it's definitely not an elixir. Now the reason why you want this on every single life is because it's relatively cheap for one, uh, usually around about 1.6 mil silver, which is really really low, but the main factor is that it gives plus 300 additional HP, which if you've ever done any kind of capped content, or if you're ever really trying to be serious in capped content, you really want to be running this thing on every single life. So you want to bring at least anywhere from 30 to 50 per node war, depending on how much you die, maybe less if you're doing lower content. Uh, it's really, really good. I would run it pretty much all the time, and you don't necessarily need this for T1 and T2, so you don't have to run it there unless you are not hitting the HP caps, but for T3, T4, and Cap Siege, you should be running this 100% of the time, unless you are using Deep Seas. As I mentioned earlier, with the Iridescent Maywa Liquor, Perfume of Charm is your go-to perfume of choice for T4 specifically. The reasoning for this is also fairly simple. As you can see, it gives 200 HP, which is very, very nice. It also gives 10% special attack evasion rate, which is absolutely massive. So for your T4 node wars specifically, you want to be running this over deep seas. It's going to give you a massive defensive boost because again, 10% special attack evasion rate is really, really good. So if you are running this, say, with the Jin Spec Evas, and you have a Garmoth on your offhand, you already have about a 40% special attack evasion rate, which is absolutely bonkers to have. If you throw on the Iridescent Mayo Liquor with it, that's going to be 42%. And then if you also throw on the Untouchable Artifact setup, that's going to be even more. So, again, special attack evasion rate is one of the best, if not the best, defensive stat that you can get in the game. So having this on T4 is going to give you a big noticeable increase to tankiness. Uh, it's very, very, very good. If you have the Immortal version, you can also use that if you want. And so, yeah, rounding out to the very end of our consumables before we talk about elixirs, which is going to be a little bit later. I want to talk about the one and the only elixir of deep sea. So this consumable is something that is essentially very, very luxury. Uh, you're not going to be able to use this every single node war because it's super expensive. It's hard to get. 
and um, it's really, really good. Uh, the reason why it's really good is because it gives percentage-based modifiers, such as back attack and down attack damage, and air attack, if you have air attacks. So the big kicker about this is when a target gets CC'd and is on the floor, you're already doing 10% extra damage to them, which is actually huge. Especially in combination with Chimera Earrings, which we'll talk about a little bit later, having that extra down attack damage is really, really noticeable. Even if you hit them from behind, it's still pretty fat. So if you have the money, or if you're able to buy these with the Resplendent Medals of Honor, it's really, really juicy. But again, this is super luxury. You're not going to have this every single node war, and you really only want to be using them for the fights that actually matter. You know, like super sweaty 1v1s, or if you have an immortal version, which is even better, you probably want to be popping those. But otherwise, don't trust if you don't have this. This is essentially as luxury as it gets because it gives you so much extra damage. And uh, yeah, use it whenever you can. So, now that we have most of the basic buffs out of the way, this is essentially what your buff bar is going to look like going into every single node war. Now, from here we have one of two choices. We can either choose to use a Giant's Draft, if you don't want to go the expensive route, or we can use Elixirs, which in my personal opinion are way, way better, and I think you should use it pretty much every single Node War Siege. The only caveat to this is you need a Fairy with at least Continuous Care 3. So if you have any kind of Fairy and you don't get lucky on the non-pay to win side, and you don't get at least Continuous Care 3, unfortunately you're going to have to swipe and buy Thea's orbs in order to uh, fix that issue. But generally speaking, at least Continuous Care 3 is going to be preferred, because at any given time you are using at least 10 to 14 different elixirs. And if you do not have Continuous Care, what's going to wind up happening is that you're going to have to spawn up and manually click on each single elixir one by one, and it, it takes a ridiculous amount of time to uh, actually do that, so yeah, I highly, highly recommend if you want to use elixirs at all, you need at least Continuous Care 3, or else I would not recommend using elixirs whatsoever. Now that we actually spoke about how to activate the elixirs, uh, let's talk about what the elixirs themselves actually do, and how to even make them into the blue versions. So, the first thing you want to know is that you want to always be using the blue versions of the elixirs, pretty much all the time. You never want to be using the green versions because they're just worse and you're better off just using a giant's draft if you are not using blues. So always make sure that you have the blue versions of all your elixirs and in order to actually make them blue what you want to do is you want to buy the green versions of the elixir. So for example if I go and type in shock in the central marketplace you can see they have elixir of shock up here about 11,000 listed and what you're going to do is it's a 3 to 1 ratio so for example right now, I will buy uh, 33 for this example. We'll buy the 33, I'm going to go into my warehouse, take those out, and you can see down here we have Iblab's Essence and we have Blue Reagent. So normally what you would do is, it's going to take three greens to make one blue. So essentially I'm going to open my processing menu, I'm going to go into Simple Alchemy, I'm going to put in the green elixirs, and I'm going to put in a Blue Reagent, and we're going to start it. And this is going to cook those three green elixirs into one blue. Now the reason that we have Iblab's Essence is because this will allow you to craft 10 at once. And uh, if you're not using Iblab's Essence, it's going to take a really, really long time to be able to turn, you know, let's say 300 into 100. So anytime you're crafting in bulk, which is what you should be doing, you want to buy maybe 300, 600 green elixirs. And then you're going to put the elixirs in. You're also going to put the Iblab's Essence in, and you're going to put Blue Reagent. And when you start this, next time when you craft them, you're going to be making 10 at a time, which is really, really important. So make sure anytime you are actually crafting your elixirs, always have a surplus of these two materials. And you can buy them right up here at the material vendor in Hydel. If you go up near the Fountain Marketplace, go to material vendor up here, or any material vendor for that matter. You can go to the shop. And right here you can buy the blue reagent to actually make them blue, and you can buy the Iblab's Essence in order to do 10 at a time. So that's pretty much all you need really to make them into blue. Um, and now with that being said, let's look at the effects of the elixirs themselves. Starting from the top, the first most important elixir that we're going to want to have active for every single T1 and T2 is going to be of course the elixir of strong shock. 
Now basically all this elixir does is it helps us to cap the 5 out of 5 critical hit rate on our character passives. So if you don't have this active, as you can see, even with food buff active, we are not going to hit that. So this is essentially the replacement for the Giant's Draft, because as you can tell, the Giant's Draft already has 3 crit on it. So you have to be using this no matter what. Unless you're using a Spirit Perfume Elixir, but you really shouldn't be doing that in T1s unless you need the extra HP. Uh, so yeah, make sure you're running Chong Shot. It's really, really good. The next most important elixir that we're going to want to be using, guys, is of course going to be the elixir of sharp detection. Now, some people will say that you don't necessarily need this in order to run an elixir rota. I'm going to be honest with you guys, I, did, I would not run an elixir rotation if I did not have this active. The reason being is that most of the time you're going to be doing more or the same damage with a giant's draft if you don't have this active. Because if you don't have it, you're still, you're actually doing less damage than the giants. Because Giants, of course, gives you 10% special attack damage, which includes 10% crit. So, if you're not using a sharp detection, you are not even getting the minimum 10% that you would have gotten from a Giants. Which means that 95% of the time, if you're critting somebody, you're just going to be doing less damage. So, I would not really run an Elixir Rota if I did not have this one particular Elixir because it's just that good. Of course, it's the hardest one to get, which kind of sucks. So you have to go gather truffle mushrooms or you have to pre-order it and get lucky. But you really, really want to have this or else in my opinion, I would not be using an Elixir Rota. The next one that we have up, of course, is gonna be the Elixir of Brutal Carnage. Uh, Brutal Carnage is pretty simple. You get 15% down attack damage. Just like the Sharp Detection, this is going to be 5% more damage than the Giant's Draft. So with just these two combined, if you score a critical hit and you also score a down attack, which happens pretty much all the time in Node War, these two elixirs alone are giving you 10% more damage than you would have gotten with a Giant's Draft. So nothing really special about this one, 5% more down attack damage, most targets are always going to be down in Node War, give or take, so free 5% bonus damage, it's pretty good. Okay guys, next we have the Elixir of Lethal Assassin. So pretty much the Lethal Assassin is going to be very similar in regard to the Brutal Carnage and the Sharp Detection. Pretty much all this does is it just gives you an extra 5% back attack damage. There's nothing really special here. Um, if you're playing a full range class, maybe like Ranger, Archer, give or take, you might not even really need to run this because you're always going to be hitting people from the front and from a distance. However, it's still good if people turn their backs to you uh, or if people turn around in general. It's still really good to have. You never know when you might need it. So, 5% extra back attack, nothing really special. Definitely run it along with the rest of the percentage elixirs. Okay guys, so next we have the Merciless Sky Elixir. So this one's a little bit interesting because not every class is going to have access to air attack damage. And by air attack damage, we mean if you press K and you go to your skill menu, if you go up here to these three little buttons that says skill filter, click on that. And we're going to want to scroll down to air attack right here. So as you can see, for example, with Sage, there are only two abilities that benefit from air attack. These are, of course, going to be avoid gate and finishing touch. If you are playing a class and you don't really have that many air attacks, or if the air attacks you do have are not on very beneficial abilities, then you don't necessarily have to run the Merciless Sky Elixir. This is primarily for classes that use a lot of air attacks. So for example, uh, DK, especially Awakening DK, or really anybody else that has a lot of like floats, because floats also have air attacks on them. So if your class isn't one of those classes, then you actually don't even need to run this whatsoever. Um, so this is a little bit more on the optional side if you need to run it. Next up guys, we have the Brutal Death Elixir. I get a lot of questions about this elixir in particular because the description for it and what it does is quite misleading. So as you can see, the effects for the Brutal Death Elixir says that it has a defense nullifying damage plus 10 per critical hit. Now, most people look at this and they read it and they think that, oh, I'm going to be negating minus 10 DP whenever I hit a target with this, uh, whenever I crit a target with this. In fact, that's not actually what it does. So in my testing and according to basically anywhere you look up online, um, all this does is it actually adds 10 extra flat damage per critical hit whenever you score a critical hit. So for example, if I have an ability that has say 10 hits and they're all critical hits, I'm gonna do 100 extra flat damage to that target or targets that I hit. In the example of, let's say, for Sage, if I hit with my Magnus ability, which hits for 25 times, obviously it's, it has a 100% crit rate. So 25 times with the 10 
nullifying damage per crit, you're actually doing 20, or 250 bonus damage. This in no way, shape, or form nullifies any kind of defense. It just simply gives you extra flat damage when you score a critical hit. So much like the Elixir of Brutal Death, right now we have the Elixir of Brutal Perforation. And pretty much this is kind of like the worst version of the Brutal Death. Again guys, what this does is defense nullifying damage plus 10 per back attack. Um, you are getting 10 extra flat damage per back attack. I'm going to be honest with you guys, this is probably one of the least important elixirs. Not only is 10 damage on its own not very impressive, but the fact that you have to score a back attack for this means that you're not really going to have too much of a high uptime on how much you're able to actually get efficiency out of this elixir. So if you don't really have this, it's not the end of the world. Of course, both of these combined are very, very good if you can get a critical back attack. But generally speaking, you don't necessarily need to run these if you can't get your hands on it. Um, it's just extra luxury damage, and it works in the exact same way that Brutal Death does, where you score the back attack and you get bonus flat damage. So, pretty simple. Here we have our final offensive elixir. We have the Elixir of Lethal Destruction. Lethal Destruction is pretty cool. It's kind of like a mini giant's draft with the extra special attack damage. All this does is it gives you extra all special attack damage plus 2%. Which, of course, is going to be a critical hit, a back attack, a down attack, or an air attack. So, if you have a target on the floor, and presumably you are critically hitting them, you're going to be doing 4% bonus damage to that target that's on the floor, because you have 2% extra critical damage, and you also have 2% extra down attack damage. Uh, the same way you can get a critical back attack, or a critical air attack, etc, etc. It's pretty good to have, it's not the end of the world if you don't have this, because the bonus is quite small. But in the grand scheme of things, every bit matters. So if you want to maximize your damage potential, I would 100% run uh, Lethal Destructions. Okay guys, moving on to our first batch of defensive elixirs. First thing that we have here is going to be the Elixir of Shong Life. Now, generally speaking for T1 and T2, it is not very difficult to hit the HP caps of, I believe it's now 4,000 for T1 and 5,000 for T2, if I'm not mistaken. But if you're hitting HP caps without the need of this elixir, or a giant, since it's the exact same HP, uh, you don't actually have to run this if you don't want to. Um, so this is one of the few elixirs where you straight up don't have to run at all, as long as you're hitting that HP cap before war. And do take note that you get 500 bonus HP for the entirety of Node War. So if you are at least hitting 4,500 HP for T2s, you're going to be hitting the HP cap without this elixir. So this is pretty much only if you need the extra HP bump so you don't have to run it somewhere in your crystals or if you don't have enough gear. Otherwise, you don't need it for T1 and T2. Uh, for all other forms of content, you're going to want Elixir of Strong Life, but only for those caps, you don't have to worry about it too much. The next defensive elixir that we're going to be using all the time, guys, is going to be the Elixir of Strong Draining. As you can see, Elixir of Strong Draining essentially gives you 5 HP per critical hit which is really, really good. This is kind of the reason why people are just artificially way more tanky within any kind of capped content, because being able to heal 5 HP per critical hit, especially when you go into a base, like let's say you're sieging an enemy base and you're hitting Ricos and you know barricades, whatever, you're passively healing up so much HP, even in combat, if you're fighting an enemy ball, the more things that you're actively hitting, the more that you're healing. So having this elixir active is extremely, extremely good for your overall defensiveness and your overall tankiness like you have to be running this all the time because this in combination with another elixir that we're going to talk about and absorptions you are healing a lot of hp per hit so make sure you guys are running this all the time next on the list guys we have a choice between one of two elixirs so we're either going to be using the mix exp reaper elixir here or we're going to be using the grim soul reapers elixir now, functionally, these two are the exact same. The only difference is that the Mix EXP Reaper Elixir gives 15% combat XP, which of course we don't care about whatsoever. And the Grim Soul Reaper's Elixir just gives the 3 HP per hit. So of course, the big kicker for these two Elixirs is that they both give the 3 HP per hit. Pretty much if you can't get your hands on the Grim Soul Reaper's Elixir, you're going to want to buy the EXP Reapers. These actually sell quite a bit. So you're going to want to use whichever one you have more of. Uh, if you can't get Grim Souls, use EXP Reapers. If you can't get EXP Reapers, then use Grim Souls. They're the exact same. Uh, but essentially, having 3 HP per hit means that you're healing 3 flat HP 
every single time you hit with anything, which is absolutely massive, because in combination with uh, strong draining, you're basically healing 8 HP per hit all the time, no matter what you do, if, assuming you have 100% crit. These two, coupled with absorptions, you're going to be healing 10 HP per hit, which you can kind of see how it stacks up in a really funny way. So um, yeah, you want to make sure that you're using this and you're using draining all the time because it lets you heal a lot. <laughs> it's pretty good. Moving into the final defensive base elixir, we have arguably, if not honestly, the most useless elixir possible. You really don't need this if you don't want it. If you don't have it, it's not a big deal, but it is going to be the strong resurrection elixir. So. What this does is it gives you HP recovery plus 15. Now the way this HP recovery actually works is that it is HP per five seconds. Um, <laughs> so that means that you're recovering an additional 15 health. Yes, a whole 15 health every five seconds. To be honest, 15 HP isn't really worth much of anything. It's really not that crazy. Uh, the only reason why I still run this is because if we go to the uh, actual crystals, if you have a Heite's tier, Heite's tier, which is the T3 version, actually already gives you HP recovery plus 25. So HP recovery plus 25 in combination with the 15 from Strong Resurrection, you get 40 HP recovery additionally every five seconds. It's not the biggest thing. It's really not that crazy, but it could be the difference between you surviving from a bleed or living with like a little bit of HP. Um, otherwise, between this and Merciless Sky, this elixir is just very underwhelming. You don't necessarily have to run it. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much how that one works. Okay, so finally guys, moving on to the utility-based elixirs. We have first off here, the elixir of overwhelming endurance. Essentially all this does is it gives you 150 additional stamina, which is unfortunately less than what Giants actually gives. So Giants gives 200, the endurance only gives two or 150, excuse me. So. It's okay. I mean, you kind of have to run it because if you don't run it, then you just lose out on a big chunk of stamina. Um, so we pretty much just run this in place of not having the giant stamina. It's still pretty good. It's only 50 less. Um, not really too much else to say about that. So second to last, we have the Soaring Wings Elixir. So Soaring Wings, much like the Strong Resurrection and much like the Merciless Sky, is probably on the lower end of useful elixirs that you can run. Um, just generally speaking because it only increases your jump height which if you're not playing a flex class that needs jump height so if you're not like a, a ninja kuno or some type of gauntlet like striker mystic um, it's not really going to be that impactful for you i also heard that ranger might want to use this because it influences their hops um, but nonetheless it's really not that helpful the main application of this is to help you climb in like really annoying areas like if you have to climb some type of terrain or if you're like in a really weird area with like a lot of rocks, this might help you. Um, the thing that this really helps out for actually is during siege, when you have to climb siege walls and you can't open the gate because you might get swarmed. This is actually pretty good. It helps you climb the walls a little bit easier because they can be really, really frustrating. You know, you always barely make it. Uh, other than that, for like a normal node war, you definitely do not need to run this. I would say this, Resurrection and Merciless, these are like kind of the optional ones, so to speak. So don't feel bad if you can't get your hands on this one. The final utility elixir, and arguably one of the more important ones, is of course going to be the elixir of Intrepid Swiftness. Uh, Intrepid Swiftness basically just gives you plus three movement speed, which again is very, very important to hit that uh, five movement speed. It's actually pretty good. Now you don't actually need this to hit five movement speed. If you have a movement crystal in your uh, gem setup, so right here, if you actually have the crystal set up, uh, you don't really need that, but most people might not have their costume tailored. So in the event that you don't have that, you wanna be using this so that way you can hit five movement speed. It's very, very important. Okay, so now that we went over all the elixirs and what they do, guys, I wanna talk about what kind of gear loadout you wanna be running for your T1 and T2 war specifically. So the first thing and the most obvious thing getting started is we're going to want to have two times Chimera Pupil Gem Earrings. Now, the reason why these are so important is because if you can see by the stats, they give 10% extra down attack damage per earring, which means that anytime you get a grounding CC on an enemy, so whether they're landing from a float, if they got hit by a bound or a knockdown, 
um, you're going to be doing 10% more bonus damage to them per earring. So both of these combined is going to be 20% bonus down attack damage. Um, now you might be wondering if you're a newer player, why is this so important? Well, essentially, if we open the world map here and we go to a tier 2 node, so for example, we have Hasbro Cliff, you can see that the AP limit is only 362. Of course, we're way past that AP limit, as are most players that are going to be. So the only way to increase your damage past this point is by percentage-based modifiers. So much like the purpose of the elixirs where we have, for example, additional critical hit damage or additional down attack damage, you want to always be using chimeras for basically every single form of capped PvP content because it is one of the very few ways that we can increase our damage without really having to go out of our way with special buffs. So chimera gems are pretty much the number one way that you want to increase your damage in T1 and T2 no more specifically and even T3 or T4. Like pretty much for all cap content and siege, you want to be using this literally all the time. The damage is just way too good to pass up. Of course, you can buy it in Trents from the NPC named Mandolf. There are a lot of videos on how to do it. It's super duper easy. It barely costs any money. I think each earring costs maybe like 100k silver. Um, so go right over to Calpheon, go right to Trent. It takes maybe like two minutes and buy yourself some Chimera earrings. So the next thing that we have, guys, is going to be the Kaya Necklace. So the Kaya Necklace, much like the Chimera People Gem earrings, pretty much the only purpose this serves is to give you more additional percentage-based modifiers. In this case of the Kaya Necklace, we get an additional 10% extra back attack damage. Now this is really, really good for T1 and T2. You can also potentially run this in T3+. Plus. But the thing about this in T1 or T2 is that the HP cap is very, very low. So you don't necessarily compromise the extra HP that you would have gotten from, say, a Moonlit Necklace of your choice, right? Because that gives 150 HP. So in T1 and T2 specifically, you don't have to worry about the additional HP requirement. And instead, you can safely run the Kai Necklace for an additional 10% back attack damage. I wouldn't really recommend running this in any form of higher content just because I value the 150 HP from the Necklace way higher than that of 10% back attack damage. Not to mention that it's also way more conditional to get a back attack than it is to get a normal crit or a down attack. So it's a pretty good damage bump, but you also have to consciously make the effort of getting the back attack in the first place. And it's also really, really good on T1 and T2 because there's always fighting going on. So uh, you can also buy this from the same spot that you buy the Chimera gems, and it's pretty much from Mandolf and Trent. So when you go to Trent, speak to Mandolf and buy two Chimeras and also buy your Kaya necklace. Really, really good to have, and it's just free damage. So next up, we're going to be talking about the offhand that you should be using. So typically speaking, you want to be running a Kudum or a Tuvala offhand. The reason for this is that Tuvala is essentially the exact same thing as Kudum, and Kudum gives a nice 10% ignore all resistance, which is quite good. And I do believe it to be a little bit better than the all resistance that you get from, say, a Nuver. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter which one you run. If you don't have a Kudum or a Tuvala for some reason, you can always run Nuver. The whole thing here is that these give the 10% special all attack extra damage. So again, 10% more crit, down attack, etc. And even bonus points if you have a Garmoth on it. So for example, I have Garmoth on my Kudum. It gives me a little bit of an extra bonus to stamina, 100 stamina. If for some reason you don't hit HP caps, which let's be honest, you're probably going to hit HP caps if you have a Garmoth offhand. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a nice little bump in case you do have the Garmoth offhand. Um, otherwise, guys, the meta of Rosar or AP offhand is basically completely dead. So you're going to be running a Kudum offhand, a Nuver offhand, or a Tuvala offhand. All three choices are perfectly good and fine, as they all give the 10% special bonus damage. So one of the next things that you can do in terms of pure luxury min-max setups is that you can actually come over here to the Central Marketplace, type in Starlight, and you can get yourself a cup of Dwindling Starlight. Now what this does is it's a reform cup that you put onto your ring, and essentially it gives you 3% bonus critical hit damage. Now for T1 and T2, this is quite good because HP is capped. However, on other forms of content such as T3 or T4 or Cap Siege or even Uncapped, I would really recommend using HP instead. But if you are going super sweaty mode in T1 or T2 and you want to min max your performance to the T, then you can buy two cups of Dwindling Starlight or grind it yourself. 
as long as you have an applicable ring, so a crescent, a cadre, a forest runneros, etc. Uh, you can put it onto one of those and what you can actually do is instead of putting the critical cups on your main rings in case you do other content you can actually just go and buy for example a cheap base ring of crescent guardian and as long as you're hitting ap caps you can just buy two of these put two starlet cups on them and then boom you have six percent extra critical hit damage so it's a little bit sweaty it's very very min max uh, but if you do a lot of that type of content it could be something to look into. Uh, you know, it's not that bad. Okay, fellas, so next up I want to talk about what artifacts and light stones you should be running and why you should be doing so. So, generally speaking, for any kind of T1 or T2 node war, um, the caps are really, really low. So you're always going to be hitting AP caps and you're most likely going to be hitting DR caps and whatnot. So there's not a whole lot of good choices on what artifacts you can actually run. So that leaves us with basically one of two choices. We either have one max HP artifacts or we have max stamina artifacts. So the thing is, if you're hitting HP caps, you want to be running max stamina artifacts. If you are not hitting HP caps, you want to be running HP artifacts. Now, right now I have HP artifacts because of course I don't do T1 and T2 currently. However, if I did, I would have these in uh, stamina artifacts. Now, as for lightstone sets, there's basically three different lightstone sets that you can use. So the first choice that we have is going to be the budget set, which is of course going to be stomping. Stomping is pretty simple. Basically the reason why you take it is because it gives you an additional 6% down attack damage. Really, really good damage. Again, if they're on the floor, you're doing 6% bonus damage. The other two damage options that you have are going to be target openings, which basically gives you 6% critical damage bonus, which is quite good. And the final offensive option that we take, which is in my opinion the best one, is going to be Crocodile's Tooth. So the reason why Crocodile's Tooth is the best is because it gives you the highest amount of percentage based modifiers, being that it gives you 6% down attack damage, and it also gives you 3% critical damage. So you still retain the 6% down attack from stomping, and you get half of the critical damage bonus from target openings, which is 3%. So you do slightly less damage to a standing target, but overall you're doing more damage because you essentially have 9% bonus special attack damage. So whichever one you guys decide to use, if you don't really have the money and you can't afford a strike, you can just use a stomping set. There's nothing wrong with that. If you do have the money and you can get your hands on, say, a strike, um, look into doing the Crocodile's Tooth. It's a lot of really, really good bonus damage. As you can see right here, you get the 5% down attack and the 2% crit from the set effect itself and you also get the bonus one percent from the strike and the ground so very very good damage set those are pretty much your three choices you can also run a defensive setup if you really want to with the uh with the siege weapon protection set but i don't really recommend running that because siege weapons aren't that much of a threat in t1 or t2 and to be completely honest it's just better off having full damage so those are my top recommendations for the light zone setups that you can use and again if you hit the hp caps use stamina if you do not hit hp caps then use maximum hp the other light zone setup that we're going to talk about guys is for t4 only now the setup for t4 specifically is going to be untouchable if you have any experience with evasion builds you probably already know what untouchable is but basically speaking, the reason why we want this for T4 is because, again, we get 150 maximum HP, which is really, really nice. We also get a bonus 3% special attack evasion rate. We pretty much get 2% from the set effect itself. And then we get the extra 1% from the disrupt light stone. So once again, special attack evasion rate is one of the most important stats defensively. And if we couple this up with, say, the Iridescent Maywa Liquor, these two things combined are going to give us an additional 5% special attack evasion rate, which is really, really good. So on T4, if you can get your hands on an untouchable setup, it's going to be definitely superior compared to the other damaging setups. Now, you can still run the other damage setups, but again, special attack evasion rate is super good. You just become way, way tankier due to the nature of spec eva rate. So uh, yeah, I would highly recommend getting this as soon as you can for T4. There is another thing that I should mention, guys. So, if you are a class that does not need the additional max HP to hit caps, 
and if you are a class that does not necessarily need the additional stamina, you can actually wind up running the Black Spirit's Rage Max Increase artifacts. And these essentially just give you 10% extra Black Spirit's Rage uh, per artifact. So if you're playing like a Zerker or you know any class like that that doesn't really need the extra stamina, you can run this and that's also perfectly fine. With two of these, it'll be essentially the equivalent of running Tongue Rat accessories. They just increase your overall max capacity for BSR, which is not really that bad in the grand scheme of things. Um, so that is a little bit of an alternative if you are not using max HP or maximum stamina. Another piece of gear that you're going to want for pretty much every single node war is going to be the Trina Demolition Axe, aka just known as the Trina Axe. So essentially what this does is you can equip this in place of your main hand, and you can either LMB for a quick hit, or you can do RMB for a heavier hit and do more damage. Now, the secret technology with the axe is that you want to hold down Q and RMB at the exact same time. That's all you got to do. Just hold down Q and RMB, and the forward guard animation is going to cancel the heavy hit animation, resulting in a much faster chop and just pretty much a much faster burn on whatever you're trying to take down. So, if you can have at least a small group of people in your ball, or if not your entire ball with axes at the ready, um, if you're given a circumstance where you're able to just axe a fort for free, you can essentially kill a fort within 10 to 15 seconds easily. Like, if everybody actually has the discipline to pull out the axe, especially when the call is made, you can do some really, really crazy stuff. Uh, it's also very, very important for siege walls as well. One of the best things to take out siege walls especially if you don't have access to a ballista so yeah overall a really important item to have super duper easy to make honestly you can make one within like five minutes give or take and you can even force enhance it up to try so try trina x is like the minimum requirement if you have tet or pen it's even better but if you have it at all like you, you have to get it it's uh it's really really good Okay guys, so the next thing that I want to talk about in terms of what you need to have for gear and your overall node war loadout are going to be taps and traps, and I mean in-game traps of course. So the first thing that we have here is going to be polished stone. So if you've been playing BDO for a little bit, you know that they recently reworked all types of polished stone, so the impeccably polished stone, the miracle imbued stone, it is now literally all polished stone. So essentially what this does is you're in node war, you take a bad base trade, your stick, aka your fort, gets low HP, uh, you basically go up to your fort, you press R, and you can start to tap, quote unquote, your fort using these polished stones. Now, the thing about the polished stone and the tapping the fort is that how fast you can actually tap the fort, so your actual tap timer, is dependent on your actual life skills. So if we go here to life skill info, as you can see, I barely have any life skills down on my Sage. Quite unfortunate. But essentially speaking, there is a formula, and I'll probably have the formula on screen, give or take. Um, but there is a formula where the more your life skills are leveled up, the faster your tap times are going to be. Uh, so the base repair time when you actually click on a four is 40 seconds. But if you have the appropriate life skills leveled up, you can actually get your four tap timer down all the way to 20 seconds, which is not that bad whatsoever. So, essentially speaking, um, if you have a professional life skill, that reduces it by one second. If you have an artisan life skill, that reduces it by two seconds, master is three seconds, and guru is four seconds. So you can have literally any combination of life skills that you want. It doesn't matter if you have guru hunting and guru trading and you know skilled training. It doesn't really matter what the combination is. You just want to have a certain combination of life skills leveled up. So that way when you actually need to tap the fort using polished stone, you're not sitting there for 40 seconds and you know getting hit by a cannon. That's also the important thing about having a good tap timer is that if you have a 20 second tap timer with good life skills, you can actually get a tap on the fort in between cannon shots, which is super, super important. Um, because if you guys don't know, you can fire a cannon around every 20-ish seconds, give or take. 
So depending on the distance and all that other stuff, if you have good life skills, you can basically tap before the cannon will shoot you again. Uh, because under normal circumstances, if you don't have a 20 second tap timer, any kind of cannon pressure that's going to be on your base is going to cause you to not be able to tap your fort. So it is pretty important to have these polished stone, even if you don't have really good life skills for a 20 second tap timer, you still want it in the event that your fort takes critical damage and your shot caller calls for everybody to tap the fort. So make sure you guys have this, it's super super good, you will wind up needing it, and if you don't have it, you're kind of trolling your ball a little bit. So for the next section guys, we're going to talk about traps. So if you go here to the guild military supply manager, and you go to the guild military supply, uh, if you scroll down just a tiny little bit, you see that you can buy traps with your allowance. And there are pretty much four traps that you need to worry about. So we have stun traps, flame traps, venom traps, and ankle traps. Now, generally speaking for T1 and T2, the main traps that you're going to be using are pretty much going to be stun traps and venom traps for the most part. Uh, stun traps, you can basically just place it down. If somebody hits the stun trap and they're not protected by super armor, uh, they're going to get stunned for a really long time. As you can see, 10 seconds to be standing in place is a really, really long time. Not only that, but if you get hit by a stun trap, you actually cannot V from the stun trap. So a little trick that you can do is, let's say you approach an enemy base and you get hit by a stun trap and you're just standing there because you literally cannot do anything. If you try to V it, if you V too early, when you come out of the V, you're still going to be in the stun trap animation, right? So what you want to do is if you get hit by a stun trap, you want to wait for somebody to actually come by and CC you, and then you want to activate your V. Because what happens is the CC that the enemy put on you actually overrides the stun trap CC. So instead of being stunned for 10 seconds and trying to V and coming out of V and being stunned, you want to wait for anybody to come CC you first and then immediately V. You don't actually want to waste your V. It's kind of like the same concept when a Zerker grabs you. Um, you don't want to V the long grab because you're just going to pop up in his arms anyway. Um, so it's basically the same thing with the Stun Trap. Uh, really annoying, but these uh, can be countered by any class that has good SA movement. So basically like a Blader um, is the perfect example. They can just dash over your traps and they will do absolutely nothing. Other than that, they're pretty good utility because a 10 second stun is pretty much a guaranteed kill. If the enemy doesn't have V and they don't use it properly, it's a 100% guaranteed kill. The next trap that we have is going to be one of the less popular ones. So flame trap, pretty much, this is really good for demounting people off of horses. If you have any enemy players that like to do weird doom horse stuff or like weird tamer stuff, if they hit the flame trap, it'll instantly demount them, which is quite good. It's really not that bad. Other than that, it doesn't really do that much damage. The main purpose of this is to stop dream horse rushers and like doom horsers so that's pretty much that uh venom trap traditionally used to be the most broken trap that you could use for t1 content mostly because there was hp decay and so as you can see 350 damage every two seconds for 20 seconds is like obscenely long like it's actually really broken um and back when they had hp decay so if you're like you know 2500 hp getting hit by one of these basically means that if you're not getting healed after a certain point you can actually just die from one of these things and you kind of still can like if you're really really low hp and you don't get healed this is actually going to do more damage than your potion ticks which is pretty disgusting i'm pretty sure it does more damage than potion let's see so yeah potion only heals you for 275 the venom trap itself does 350 damage so <laughs> if you're not having some kind of healing, you're going to die. Really, really good trap. It doesn't matter if somebody walks over it with um, super armor. They're still going to take the debuff. And these couple with like bleeds, you're going to take a lot of extra damage. So I would say stun trap and venom trap are like the main traps that you can use. Ankle trap is also an okay option. It's really not that bad. It, it's all right. Um, it's a 40% movement speed slow for 10 seconds, which I mean, it's quite a long time and 40% slow is really big, but it doesn't really have the raw impact of a stun trap, and it doesn't really have the raw lethality of a venom trap. However, if let's say somebody did decide to run through a base and pop all the traps, they cannot eat or they cannot get rid of the slow by being in a super armor state, 
because you can still get slowed in a super armor state. Whereas with the stung traps, if they're in super armor, they're just going to eat the trap. So there's a little bit of a choice here between the stung trap or the ankle trap. Stun is a little bit better if it goes off. If not, then ankle is a little bit better for the slow. But generally speaking, for most of your node wars, you're either going to use stung traps or venom traps. These are both really good. Finally, of course, we have elephant traps. We're not going to talk about this because there is no elephant in T1 or T2. This is only really for like a T3 and Siege kind of thing, so we're not going to talk about that. But yeah, those are the traps that you can get. You can buy these pretty much at any time, as long as you have some kind of allowance. Generally, I would recommend at least maybe like 5 to 10 traps in total. Um, you can have 3 traps down at any given time. So whenever you have idle time during a war, if your shot caller calls to put down a bunch of traps, you know, you're going to have the trap in your bag, you're going to click on the trap, and you're going to find a blue peg to actually put it down. And that's basically it. It's uh, super duper easy. There's one quick note that I would like to make about the traps, and it's actually quite important. So the one thing that you really don't want to do, especially when you have traps, is let's say this tree right here is your, your fort, right? Like this is the stick, this is your fort. You don't ever want to place traps inside the actual base. And the reason why you don't want to do this is because Let's say there's like a recovery sensor over here, there's like an FT. Every trap that you place that takes up one of these pegs actually interferes with the placement for any kind of potential structure that you can put down. So if I put my trap right here on the singular peg on this rock, that means that this is going to cuck the positioning of a possible FT, a possible RICO, a possible supply depot, etc. etc. So Unless explicitly called for by defense or the shot caller that it's okay for you to put a trap in the base because it's impossible to get rebuilds or you're going to die anyway, you never want to place traps inside your actual base because this is going to be harder for your defense to actually rebuild important stuff like FTs and Ricos and nobody's going to know why. It's just going to be because of some random trap that nobody thought about. So uh, yeah, just don't be that guy. And when you actually have to place a trap, you know, place it outside the base. Just click on the blue peg and you hit confirm. It takes a couple seconds to place the trap. And then boom, you have a trap down. Uh, obviously the enemy won't really see that. But yeah, that's pretty much how you place the trap. Just don't put it inside the base and uh, you should be good to go. So something very important to note guys is that at any point after your guild or alliance drops a stick, you want to make sure that you're hitting the G button and you're going over to the fourth tab here that says guild member status over by the right side where it says participate next to your name you're gonna make sure that you click on this button that says no and you're gonna make sure that you hit enter or yes now the reason why you do this is because if you're not quote-unquote yes up you literally cannot participate in the node war so at any given time after your guild drops a stick, make sure that you go into this menu and actually yes up. Of course, if I try to do it now, it says there is no fort, but as long as there's a fort down and if you're on the right server, you'll be able to yes up. Now, the right server is pretty much dependent on where the node war is going to be. Now, let's say for example, we look at the T2 node of Hazra Cliff. I know that Hazra is a part of Medaya, so I know that if there's a node war in Hazra, that the main server is going to be a Medea one. And the reason for this is that the one server are all the war servers. So no matter what you do, any war server is always going to be a Medea or Calpheon or Serendia, etc. It just depends on where the actual node war is located in that region. So yeah, once you do that and you yes up, you'll be good to go for the node war and just make sure they have everything good to go. Another thing you want to make sure of guys is that you have ample amounts of instant HP potions and instant MP potions or if you have the infinite health pot or infinite mana pot make sure that you have them in your family inventory preferably. If you do not have an infinite HP pot or mana pot make sure that you have at least several hundred of each of these potions within your marketplace and your storage. The reason why this is important is because let's say you only bring, I don't know, 300 health pots and they decide to run out. You can always have them in your central market and you can just take them out of here. You can also take mana pots out of here. 
and you can also have them in your storage if you want and take them out from your storage. So having them in both is pretty good in case you run out of storage maids or in case you run out of market maids. Um, but just make sure that you have ample amounts of both so that way you don't run out in the middle of war. The next quick thing that I want to talk about guys is make sure that before you go into the real war that you have all of your gear repaired. Make sure all of your accessories are repaired, your armor, etc, etc. Before every war starts, make sure that you full repair everything. Repair your horse gear. Make sure your horse is also recovered too. Because if your gear breaks in the middle of war and you don't have a supply depot, you're going to have to go all the way back to town in order to do one repair. And uh, it's pretty annoying. Another important thing that I want to talk about, and this is also something that's very, very irritating if it happens, is so let's say we go over to the t2 karuto cave node right so you can kind of see how this like whole upper half is a part of the node war zone this whole like bluish area whatever and then there's this bottom half well the thing about this is that if we go back to the normal map and we see there's a dark rift here if you are fighting anywhere near a dark rift in the actual node war zone what winds up happening is that you get instance with the Dark Rift boss, so you can see everything that's going on around you. You can see enemy players. I'm not sure if they can see you. I don't think they can, but you can't do damage to anybody, and they can't do damage to you. So you kind of get locked into this like area where you're forced to fight the Dark Rift boss. So make sure before you have a Node War in any area, especially in uh, Calpheon, that you don't have any Dark Rifts that are in the actual Node War Zone. Because if there's an enemy base placed like right there on that Dark Rift, you're gonna have to swap servers and uh, and kill the Dark Rift boss and then swap back to the War server. It's like really, really annoying. So yeah, make sure that you don't have any Dark Rift up because it's super annoying, it's super troll. And um, yeah, don't do it. <laughs> so I briefly spoke about it a little bit earlier. But I want to go a little bit more into detail about node war caps. So what we want to do is we want to open our world map. And we want to go to the top right hand corner over here where it says node war information. Click on that button. And we're going to go over here to the T2 Kurudo cave. And essentially all these stats you want to make sure that you're hitting pretty much all the caps except the evasion rate limit percentage and the accuracy rate limit percentage. Every other stat on this list, you want to make sure that you are capping. So if the number is in green, you know that you have the proper amount of stat for that cap. Not only that, but you want to be capping every node war with the actual gear on. So you want to make sure that you're hitting AP caps with Chimeras and with Kaya. You want to make sure especially that you're hitting the DR caps. Because if you're not hitting DR caps, you're going to take a lot of damage compared to somebody that uh, that does. So, make sure you're hitting AP cap. AP cap is very, very easy. Pretty much anything that gives AP contributes to that number, that 362 AP limit. So, again, if we look at our buffs, the AP from the church buff, the AP from the villa buff, the AP from the food, the AP from the alchemy zone, all of the AP from those buffs all contribute to this number right here. And even any extra damage to humans, so we have 42, that also contributes to that number. So you have many, many ways to get to the AP limit. It's actually pretty much the easiest cap to hit. The evasion limit, you can pretty much get that by using a Kudum. Kudum gives you a little bit more EVA, so if you need help hitting that for some reason, you can just run a Kudum if you're not already. The evasion rate limit, you don't necessarily have to worry about hitting that cap specifically. Not every class has access to additional evasion rate percentage limit, so you never really have to worry about capping that. Um, some classes can, some classes can't. Otherwise, you're never really going to be capping that if you're a non-eva rate capper. The other cap is the damage reduction limit. DR limit is pretty important. That's just basically flat, uh, flat DR. So. If you're not hitting that, you're going to be really, really squishy. So you want to make absolute certain that you're hitting the DR limit cap. Otherwise, you're going to die really fast. The next cap is going to be the damage reduction rate limit percentage. That's pretty much just the percent that you get for 
having a new bracket of DP. So for example, this bracket of DP of course is 30% because the last bracket is 401. So you'll hit that passively. You don't really have to actually worry about doing anything to hit that. If you hit the flat DR cap, you are more than likely gonna hit that. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, accuracy limit is super duper easy to hit. Again, we run L cars in the build, so it's even easier to hit. Accuracy rate limit is another one of those things where some classes might be able to hit it, other classes not so much. In the example of the Sage, if we go to Spatial Fissure, we can see that it gives 18% accuracy rate. So right now, if we look at the cap and we see that we are 12% out of the 15% cap. However, if I use my Spatial Fissure, which gives the additional accuracy, and then we look at the cap, we can see that we're 30%. So we're over capped actually on the accuracy rate limit. So any buffs or any kind of add-ons that are gonna give you accuracy rate limit or evasion rate limit are gonna be very, very good. Um, very, very good stuff to have. The all resistance limit is also 30%, which is really easy to hit. I feel like you just kind of naturally hit it. And the special evasion rate limit comes from the special evasion crystals which you, you pretty much have to run in the build. Uh, so yeah, just make sure that you hit all the caps with the chimeras and with the Kai necklace on, and uh, it should be pretty easy. So I just wanna make a quick note about something, guys. Make sure that when you're in node war, before the node war actually starts, and every time you respawn, that you have show node installation area toggled on. And what this does is it pretty much lets you see the end of the node war zone so right now, for example, I'm in Alejandro Farm, and if you can see that little squiggly line right there, that is pretty much the ending of the actual Node War area. So if you step outside of this area, you're no longer considered in the actual Node War zone, right? But what that means is that anybody out here is going to be able to hit you with full gear. And uh, you can also do the same thing. So if it ever comes to like an out of zone fight, you have to make sure that if you're in that area, if you don't have good gear, you can potentially get gear checked. So uh, yeah, make sure that you have your node war border turned on. So you can see where the end of the node war is or if there are any out of zone areas. So the next topic that I wanna talk about is going to be your add-ons. So add-ons are a pretty important step in your node war setup because typically speaking, these allow you to have access to more percentage-based buffs than otherwise. And a big mistake that I see a lot of new players make is that their add-ons will include some kind of combination of human damage or DP down or plus DP. And in all reality, the caps are very, very low. So running any kind of DP down or running any kind of human damage doesn't really do anything because human damage contributes to the overall AP cap. So for example, if we look in game here and we go back to the T2 Hazard node, we can see that my AP is 465 for succession and the AP limit is 362, but it also says extra damage to humans 42. So that extra damage to humans actually goes towards the total AP cap. So if you're already well over the AP cap, there is literally no point in running any kind of flat damage increases. So what that means is basically no flat AP, no flat DP, no human damage, no monster damage. You don't want to have recover mana add-ons and very seldom do you want chance to down smash or air smash. Like those are all probably the worst add-ons that you can use for any kind of cap content. Instead, what you wanna be using is you want to be using add-ons that give you percentage modifiers. So if we look here, we have things like plus evasion rate. Again, percentage-based modifiers. We have plus attack speed. Also very, very good for 99% of classes. Um, additional critical hit rate, uh, additional accuracy rate, recover HP, etc., etc. The reason why these are so good is because the other options are simply just bad. So anything that gives you bleed, critical hit damage, HP on hit, attack speed, percentage evasion, percentage accuracy, those are pretty much the best add-ons that you can possibly run in all capped content because they allow you to do more damage just by virtue of exploiting certain caps. So again, if we look at the map and we go to Hazard Cliff, which is a T2, 
we can see that the accuracy rate limit is 15%. And my accuracy rate currently right now is 12%. However, if I go back to my skills, and for example, I look at spatial fissure, whenever I activate this ability, I get 18% all accuracy rate for 10 seconds. Pretty balanced, I know. So now if we use that ability and we go back here, you're gonna be way past the accuracy rate limit, which means that your chance to hit other targets is gonna be higher. And of course, if your chance to hit other targets is higher, that means that you do more damage overall. In the same way that if you have add-ons that increase your evasion rate, or if you're a class that has evasion rate passives, you're going to be taking less damage because you're getting hit a lot less. So having additional accuracy rate in your add-ons, having additional evasion rate, even if you're not an evasion class, is super important. And the simplest way that you can think about this is basically, if you have more evasion rate uh, percentage, you are going to be tankier to everybody else. If you have more accuracy rate percentage, you're going to hit people more often, so you're, you'll do more damage. And on top of that, if you have add-ons that basically give minus accuracy rate, so in this case we have minus 4% accuracy rate, whenever I hit somebody with this ability, I am reducing their chance to hit me and all of my other party members by 4%. So with add-ons like this, you're effectively making yourself and everybody with you tankier. Um, so it's very, very good. Of course, if we have things that give evasion shred, so for example, a Taurus Mark is a 9% evasion shred at base, that is going to help to reduce other players' evasion rate, which is going to make them take more damage. So you can see how it all adds up. The whole thing that we're doing is we're abusing percentage-based modifiers to get more damage than what the caps actually allow us to get. So whenever you guys craft your add-ons, you want to make sure that you guys all have any kind of percent modifiers, any kind of attack speed, bleed, HP recovery. These are all things that are going to be really good that you want. You know, never ever run human damage, never run minus DP, because um, chances are most targets that you hit are going to be well above the DP cap. So having a little bit of a minus 15 DP is not going to really do too much to a normal target. Uh, it'll only really come in handy if they're a gearlet, and that's kind of a gamble that you'll have to take. But in my experience, it's just more reliable to run the percentage based modifiers that always work no matter what target you're hitting for uh, all of node wars okay guys so crystals crystals are going to be a pretty interesting section and uh, i've seen a lot of other people's take on the best t1 or the best t2 loadout now in my experience this is going to be essentially the best t1 and t2 loadout that you can run if not one of the best like there's probably another alternative that you can take and I'll talk about the potential choices of that. But generally speaking, this is a page that you're going to want to run if you're hitting HP caps, if you have gear, and if you're a class that wants the additional 4% attack speed. So right off the bat, we'll go over the mandatory crystals that you absolutely must have for every single node war. The first crystals that you're gonna want are the corrupted magic crystals. So these are pretty much mandatory for like basically everything not even just T1 and T2. I mean, even in PvE, T3, T4, Siege, I mean, these are some of the best crystals that you can possibly get. Why is that? It's because they give you 22% critical hit damage with the two set effects. So if you can see right here on the bottom left side uh, where it says critical hit damage plus 20%, and then as an effect of the two piece, you get an additional 2%. So 22% critical hit damage, uh, you can't really go wrong with Corrupted Magic Crystals. You want this all the time. If you're not running this, you're kind of just trawling. Uh, the next Minotaur Crystals that we have are going to be the Jin Spec Evas. So, these actually never really used to be used in uh, T1 and T2. Because T1 and T2 traditionally, which were uh, T1 Beginner and T1 Intermediate, never used to have a Special Evasion Cap. Uh, now that's changed, they added a 20% special evasion rate cap to both T1 and T2. Um, so you want to have this pretty much all the time. If you don't have this, you are literally way squishier compared to everyone else because these two combined give you a 20% chance to not take additional bonus damage from a critical hit, a down attack, a back attack, or an air attack. So insanely big tankiness layer you really want to make sure that you're using two of these they don't have to be Jin spec evas um, if you don't need the extra hp 
or if you get the XP from a different source, you can use bonds. Um, doesn't really matter as long as you have some form of special evasion crystal. So the next thing that we want, guys, that is going to be mandatory are going to be two sets of L cars. So the reason why we use L car here is not necessarily for the accuracy, but it's simply for the ignore all resistance. Um, now on T2, the resistance caps are quite low, and I think T1s as well. So if we look here at the cap, what is it? It's actually 30%. So 30% all resistance, if you have double L car, you are ignoring 20% of that. Um, really, really good. You pretty much always wanna be running that no matter what. Ignore resistance is super duper important. The other crystals that I would highly recommend, now they're not necessarily mandatory, but to me they kinda are. You wanna be running two times magic crystal of infinity absorption. So these are pretty simple. What they do is they give you an additional one HP recovery per hit. Now, if you guys were here when I was talking about the elixirs earlier, which of course you guys were here. Uh, so in terms of the strong draining and the grim soul reapers elixir or the mix exp reaper elixir, these two elixirs combined with the absorptions basically allow you to heal 10 HP per hit, which is honestly pretty massive. So these alone are not that great, but again, these combined with the elixirs healing 10 HP per hit and then if you have add-ons that also heal you per hit, the amount of healing that you get for those caps is astronomically high. It's really, really, really good. So I can't recommend absorptions anymore. They're super duper good. Um, they're giga cheap. They're easy to get. And if you're using elixirs, then it's it's prime time. Really, really good stuff. Additionally, what we have are what I like to call the flex slots. So if you're hitting HP caps, which is not really a difficult thing to do if you're not like a brand new player, the only other way to really artificially increase your damage is, of course, you guessed it, percentage-based modifiers. So, some of the crystals that we can actually use are two times a Lucas, and we can also use two times a Crowds. The reason why we use both of these sets is because these these give two percent attack speed, and the Crowds also give two percent attack speed. So, with both of these combined, you're already getting an additional four percent attack and casting speed which is almost the equivalent of having an additional alchemy stone popped. Like it is really, really noticeable, um, especially if you're a rat class or a range class or anything like that. There is no reason to not be running these for, and, and honestly, there's no reason. After that, it really kind of depends on what class you're playing. So there's not a whole lot of good choices because again, cap content, the caps are relatively low. So for example, like, you know, on a normal damage set, you're not going to want to be running, I don't know, like, RBF Vipers, right? Because the human damage doesn't do anything because it goes towards your AP cap. So instead, what we can run is we can run additional stamina, which is very, very helpful, especially for classes like Sage that are very stamina hungry, um, or even Blader or things like that. So to alleviate this, we go with double stamina crystals in the form of Jin Hishras. Hishras give 175 stamina, which is really, really fat. We also run a Hay Taste tier. Now the Hay Taste tier, you don't necessarily need this. This is kind of pure luxury. The reason why we take this is simply because of the extra free stamina, and we also get 25 HP recovery. So you can either run this, or if you want a little bit more of a damage oriented setup, you can actually swap out the Hay Taste. And if you want, you can even put in a Garen's. So Garen's gives you the same amount of maximum stamina. It also gives you an additional 1% special attack damage which is really not that high but if you consider somebody that's down on the floor and you get a critical hit and a down attack you are doing two percent extra damage with just this crystal alone so it's not really that bad but for me i prefer the additional hp recovery since fights tend to last a lot longer in t1 and t2 the extra hp recovery in those caps goes a lot longer than it would in say an uncapped scenario and finally the last flex slot for the crystal is going to be a magic crystal of infinity endurance now the endurance crystal you don't really need this it's just an additional stamina bump and some people ask me well how come you don't have four times macalods and you can do two macalods here you can do three there and then a macalod there the thing about the macalods versus the double hishra is that the stats that you get from macalods so for example let's go to the sexual market real fast we'll type in macalod most of the stats that you get from Macalods go to pretty much a complete waste. Um, we don't really care about the AP because AP is probably the easiest stat that you can cap on for T1 and T2. The stamina is pretty cool. The ignore resistance is really not that bad. 
and the combat XP is basically completely wasted. But the thing about Maglods versus, let's say, Hishrias, is that two Jin Hishrias gives more stamina than four Maglods. And you guys can actually test this yourself if you go into Garmoth. So there's basically no point in running four Maglods, because the whole reason why you would run Maglods is for the stamina, when you can run double Jin Hishria, which gives you not only more, but you save up two extra crystal slots that we can use for even more stamina, or let's say like a Heite or a Garen's tier. Um, so that's that's my thing. I've labbed it out for quite a bit, and uh, in my testing, I don't think Maglods are worth it. You get more stamina from just double Hishria, and you also unlock two more crystal slots. So in my opinion, there's no reason to not run it. Final notes about the crystals, guys, is if you do not need the stamina, so again, if you're playing like a Zerker, or like a caster or something like that, you don't really use a lot of stamina. What you can do is you can drop, say, the Hishras, and you can put on something like Magic Crystal of Infinity Siege. This gives you 10% special, uh, or excuse me, 10% siege weapon evasion rate. So if you're getting hit by a Flame Tower or Hawasha, actually Hawashas don't exist in T1 or T2, but basically if you get hit by an FT, this will help you take a little bit less damage. Um, and for some reason, the Magic Crystal of Infinity Sieges these actually make you take way less damage than quote unquote 20% evasion rate. I don't exactly know how much this translates to, but you guys can test it for yourself. Especially if you actually do cap siege, these are really, really good versus the Huasha. Like the three shot Huasha burst that will actually just one shot you. If you're wearing these, you might actually live. So again, if you're a class that doesn't want the stamina, you can alternatively run the siege uh, evasion rate crystals. Other than that, there's really not a good choice. If you're not hitting caps, like let's say you don't really have a lot of gear, because nowadays you need three pen armors to hit caps on T1 and T2, you can actually run Crystal of Frozen Bitterness. So again, like let's say you only have one or two pen armors, and you need to hit that extra little bit of DR for the caps, you can just run some extra bitterness right here. So you have an option. Uh, let's also say, you know, you're a newer player, you don't necessarily have a lot of HP. These are kind of luxury, the attack speed crystals. So what you can also do is you can go here and you can put in, say, Bond Kobe's. And these give you a nice little 150 extra HP. And I know as like a newer player, especially on my all, it's kind of hard to hit that initial 4.5k HP. So you might just need to run a little bit of extra HP to hit that. You can also run, let's say, there's another HP crystal that's like really, really good. You can run Rebellious even if you want for the extra HP. Um, it really depends on what you need. But generally speaking, the best in slot loadout is going to include the 4% attack speed. It's just way too good. So we have 4% attack speed. We have Corrupted for the extra critical hit damage bonus. We have Absorptions for the additional healing per hit. We have Special Evasions for the additional special attack evasion rate to make you way tankier. We have Elkars for the ignore all resistance. We have Heite for a little bit of HP recovery and a little bit of stamina. And then additionally, we have either stamina slots or pretty much whatever you want to run. Like you can really put anything here. I like to run stamina because stamina is pretty good and uh, Sage really needs stamina. So uh, yeah, you guys can do that. And this is pretty much the best in slot crystal loadout guys. So let me know if you have any questions about that down below. Okay guys, so getting into the crystal setup for T3, T4, and Cap Siege. Pretty much getting started, we're gonna have the Corrupted Magic Crystals. Now, Corrupted Magic Crystals are pretty self-explanatory. They give a really, really nice chunk of critical hit damage. We are gonna run this for all forms of capped content, so T1 through 4 and Cap Siege. You're gonna want these pretty much at all times. There's no reason to not use it. Big damage, big good. Okay, so the next crystal that we're gonna talk about is of course going to be the Heite's tier. Now, Heite's tier is going to be best in slot for T3, T4, as well as Cap Siege. The reason is also pretty simple. So, the main reason is that it gives 200 additional HP, which is by far the biggest HP gain on any singular crystal. The next highest one, I believe, is the Rebellious Crystal at 175. So, the Heite's tier is super valuable. It gives DR, Evasion, so if you don't hit Caps, that can help you out. It gives a huge chunk of HP gives a nice little chunk of HP recovery and gives a little bit of special attack evasion rate as well. So this crystal is actually super duper good. Um, you definitely want to be running this 
pretty much all the time in cap content even in t1 and t2 like i said earlier it's pretty good because of the hp recovery but yeah this singular crystal alone is way too good you definitely should use this even if you have the t2 version the Hates crystal i believe it's still not that bad so uh yeah get your hands on one of these asap okay so for the next row of minotaur crystals we have the Jin Spec Evas. Now, pretty much, guys, the reason why these are going to be best in slot for T3, T4, and Cap Siege is very simple. They give special attack evasion rate plus 10%. They give 100 HP, which is also very, very good. Um, something important to note as well for T3 and T4 differences is that for T3, the special evasion rate cap is actually 20%. So if you have a Garmoth Heart on your offhand, you actually don't need to run two Jinspec Evas because you'll hit the cap with just your Garmoth offhand and one Jinspec Eva. So what I like to do for T3 specifically is I like to take away the second Jinspec Eva and I like to add, say, a Rebellious Spirit Crystal. If you don't have a Rebellious Spirit Crystal, you can also use something like a Bond Cobalinus. This also gives 150 HP, so it's only 25 less than Rebellious. But of course, Rebellious is just barely better, so we're going to use that instead. And this is what your setup here would look like for T3. If you're on T4, however, you actually do want the second gen spec EVA, because the special evasion cap on T4 is uncapped. And special attack evasion rate is one of the most important stats that you can get in this game. So if you're on T4 specifically, or even uncapped, definitely run two of these. Otherwise, for T3 and Cap Siege, you can run one Jin Spec Eva, and you can run something like two Rebellious Crystals, or two Bon Cobalinus if you don't have the Rebellious. Okay, so moving on to the next set of crystals that you want for T3, T4, and Cap Siege, we have the Bon Glorious Crystal of Courage, Ignore Resistance. Now, the reason why we use these is very simple. They have max HP plus 100, they have 10% Ignore Resistance of your type, and what you want to do is, if you're a class that uses a lot of, for example, knockdowns or bounds, then you want the Ignore Knockdown Resistance Crystal. If you're a class that, for example, uses a lot of floats, then you want the Ignore Knockback Resistance Crystal. So these are going to be superior for T3, T4, and Cap Siege because they give you the Ignore Resistance that you need, and they also give HP, which is really, really good. For T4 specifically, you are going to probably want the L cars because the accuracy cap is much higher for T4 as opposed to T3 and Cap Siege. So for T3 and Cap Siege, you're going to want these over L cars because you don't really have to worry about the accuracy caps and the HP is still very, very good. So uh, yeah, get your hands on two of these. You can basically just buy them from the market and pre-order them. Super, super good to have. Also, as I stated earlier, if you are on T4 caps specifically, you can use the Crystal of Elkar instead. Now, the reason why you want these on T4 is because the accuracy cap for T4 is actually very, very high, and there's a very good chance that you'll wind up needing these for that specific cap. They also still retain the 10% ignore all resistances, so that's also very, very good. Otherwise, if you're not on T4 cap, I would recommend just using the Bon Courage Crystals instead. Moving on to the final row of mandatory and best in slot crystals. For T3, T4, and Cap Siege guys, you are 1000% going to want 4 piece homes. Now, they don't necessarily have to be ultimate homes. Of course, the ultimate homes are much better stat wise, but you definitely, definitely want 4 piece homes. The raw stats that these things give are just absolutely ridiculous. They give a ton of stats, they give a ton of HP, as you can see. Every singular whom gives about 75 HP, and you also get an additional 150 HP from the 2 set effect, and another additional 150 HP from the 4 set effect. So having these 4 installed in your crystal loadout for T3, T4, and Cap Siege is going to be a really, really big difference compared to not having them. So uh, you definitely want these in pretty much all cap loadouts. They're way too good. And again, if you don't have the ultimate homes, it's okay. You can still use normal Han homes. Those are still just as good. But these are about the final minutes or crystals that you need for this particular loadout. 
Okay guys, so rounding out to the final four crystal slots. You're probably wondering why I have these crystal slots open and empty. The reasoning for that is very simple. So you can pretty much run whatever you want in these four crystal slots right here. Now, what I like to do personally is I like to run, for example, two times Glorious Lucas. I also like to run two times Glorious Lacrods. And people ask me, well, why are you running human damage on, you know, capped content? Why are you running monster damage on capped content? Now, we want this specifically because of the attack and casting speed plus 1%. Each one of these crystals gives 1% attack and casting speed, which as you can see over here is a total of 4%. Now, if you actually haven't tried this out before, it's really, really good. It's really, really noticeable. Um, it's something that I've been running for a very, very long time. And as you can see, compared to the Alchemy Stone, it is only 1% less than a Bell's Heart, which is actually kind of crazy. So <laughs> if you run these crystals, you pretty much get an additional Alchemy Stone which is really, really big. So if you guys are playing any kind of rat or ranged class or anything like that, and you want more raw DPS, definitely consider running the two times a Crods and the two times a Lucas. Alternatively, if you want a more tanky or more defensive approach, you don't actually have to run these. What you can do instead is you can run something like two times Bon Kobe. So again, we have an additional 150 HP here. So with these two alone, that's going to be 300 extra HP. And then if you still want the attack speed, you can slot in some Alukas or some Akrods. If you are on T4 and you want more ignore resistance and you need the accuracy, you can also use Elkars. Or if you're on T3 or Cap Siege and for some reason you want more ignore all resistance, you can run something like this. But for me personally, I really, really prefer the 4% attack speed from the Alukas and Akrods. It's really, really good. You can also run stuff like the Siege Evasion Crystals. These are also pretty good. If you're doing a lot of Siege, or if you're really scared of the Hawasha Burst attack, these are actually quite handy, and there are certain situations where you won't die in one shots at the Hawasha if you actually have these on. So, pretty much any variation of these crystals is perfectly fine. If you want more Agar resistance, you can use Elkars. If you want attack speed, you can run a Lucas or a Crods. If you want more special evasion or HP, you have the spec Evas. If you are not hitting the caps, so for example, if you don't hit DR caps or Eva caps, you can actually run something like Crystal of Frozen Bitterness as well. These are actually a really, really cheap hack to make your way into T3 caps a little bit easier. So in case you're lacking that Capris on your gear, you can just run these instead as well. Otherwise, guys, like I said, my personal preference is going to be the four times attack speed crystals because it feels really, really good. And um, if you guys haven't tried it yourself, you know, definitely give it a shot. So this is pretty much the example of what my cap to loadout will look like at the very end. Again, we have the two times corrupted magic crystal. We have a one time hate taste tier. We have one gen spec Eva. If we're on T3 and cap siege, if we are on T4, then we're going to want the double gen spec Eva like that. Otherwise, I like to run the one spec Eva and the Rebellious Crystal. We also have the four piece Hooms for the massive HP boost. We have the Bon Glorious Crystal of Courage, Ignore Resistance for the HP and Ignore Resistance. And then finally, we have our four Flex Crystal slots, which I like the attack speed. I just want to throw in a little bit of an honorable mention, guys, for the Garen's tier. Now, Garen's tier is functionally pretty useless aside from one funny stat. Now, that stat is going to be the extra all special attack damage plus 1%. Now, 1% extra special attack damage is really not that much. However, if you really, really want to min max damage, you can run this instead of the Heite's tier. I personally value Heite's tier a little bit more because it gives 200 HP, which is insane. However, if you have a target that is down on the floor, and you get a critical hit, you are technically doing 2% more special attack damage versus them. Because we have the 1% attack bonus towards critical hit damage, and the 1% bonus to down attack damage. So if you want to min-max your damage in T1, T2, or really any capped content, you can run this. But like I said, I think the Heite's tier, or Heite's crystal, are just way better. Because they give more HP, and HP is much, much better than the measly 
1% damage. I also want to mention very briefly guys about the Respondent Medals of Honor. So pretty much this is a currency that you get after your participation within a node war. And whether you lose the node war, stalemate the node war, or win, you're going to be getting a reward box which gives you these Medals of Honor. So for example, let's say I just did a node war, which we did tonight. I go to the guild member status and I click on my reward tab. I'm going to get a funny box that says something something reward. And inside these boxes, you have the Resplendent Medals of Honor. So we're going to open it. Boom, we have 122 Medals of Honor. Now, what you can do with these is you can come through to the Guild Military Supply Manager, for example, in Heidel. And you can go to Exchange here. And there are a whole bunch of goodies that you can buy with the tokens. Um, we're going to get into which ones I think you should get for the most part all the time. But my top recommendations are going to be the Elixirs of Deep Sea. You can get yourself some Deep Seas here. And nowadays that they added the Corrupt Oil, I think this is the best choice right here. If you get 6 Corrupt Oil of Immortality, you can get a free Immortal Deep Sea, which is really, really nice. It's super good for Siege as well. So generally speaking, consumable wise, you're going to want the Deep Sea or you're going to want the Corrupt Oil of Immortality. If you do a lot of Uncapped, you can alternatively buy Perfume of Courage. But if you're doing copped content, especially T1 and T2, just go with the Deep Sea and call it a day. Another really important usage of the Medals of Honor guys is going to be the skills down here. So if you open your skill menu and you go all the way down to the bottom of your main tree, you can see we have here some Node War exclusive skills, Node War and Siege that is. And the top row here are basically all flat DP. So this is Magic DP plus five. This is Range DP plus five and this is melee dp plus five per level so if you get all five you get plus 25 dp doesn't sound that bad right well if we actually look at a map and let's say again we go to the t2 hazard cliff if we look at the damage reduction limit of 327 those passives are actually going to count towards that damage reduction limit so typically speaking you don't really want to get the top row of skills because it's very easy to hit that dr limit cap um, instead, what you always want to do is you always want to get the bottom row. So you're going to want the magic evasion rate percentage. You're going to want the ranged evasion rate percentage. And you also have the melee evasion rate. Now, personally, I would not go for the melee evasion rate. I would either go with magic or ranged because we're in a pretty ranged meta. And with all the archers and rangers that are around, you're going to get a lot of mileage out of one of these two. So whichever one you get, it doesn't really matter. Um, but what you do is you have your Respondent Medals of Honor, you can go to the Supply Manager, go to Exchange, and with your medals you actually have to buy each book separately. So if I want one point of my skill for the Yanaris' Veil, I have to buy the book one. If I want to put in two points into the skill, I have to buy book two. If I want to get three points, I have to buy book three, and then so on and so forth. So you can't just necessarily get 200 medals of honor and then immediately buy book five and then get all five skill points you manually have to buy every single book by itself to get these extra points so right now if i level all this up it's because i bought book one two three four and five um, so that's pretty much what you can do with that that's like one of the main things to buy with the tokens if you already have your five node warranty skill points I would just, again, buy the Deep Seas and buy the Corrupt Oil of Immortality pretty much exclusively. And you can also buy the Calc Swings, again, like I mentioned earlier. So, uh, yeah. Finally, guys, we have the War Vendor. So, basically, what the War Vendors are is every time you successfully win a Node War, so you are the final remaining fort on the Node, you have access to one of these War Vendor shops. So, if you're doing a T1, you have access to the T1 shop. T2, same thing with 4 and 3. And basically what these guys have is they have a little bit of an inventory that you can choose from. You want to be buying the 50 Kafiris bundled boxes. You also want to be buying the Glorious Box of Spoils, I believe it's called. It's like a little bit of a gamble box. You can also buy these Essences of Honor and you can buy Essence of Gallantry. These are really, really important because you can make the Jin Spec Evas or up to Jin Spec Eva is not exactly, you're not going to get it very often, but you can make them or have a chance to get them. And you can also make the Glorious Akrods and the Glorious Alukas. Now, these are actually worth quite a nice chunk of money. 
So for example, the Glorious Lucas is around 585 mil, and the Glorious Acrod is around uh, roughly the same price. So eventually, after a couple of node wars, you're going to have a bunch of these stocked up, and if you win a node war, you can actually buy them from these shops. So unfortunately, I did not win a node war recently, so I can't show you the shops. But if you do win a node, make sure that you go to the respective war vendor of your choice, whichever one you beat. And they have a lot of good stuff in there that you can buy with silver. So uh, make sure you guys check that out. So there are a couple of extra settings that I want to go over in the next section. They're pretty much going to help you get a little bit of extra performance, a little bit of extra visual clarity. And they're going to make a lot more sense when you actually use them in practice. But with that being said, let's talk about the first setting, which I think is probably one of the most important ones. Pretty much what we're going to do is we're going to go over here to our settings wheel. And we're going to go to general settings. Next up, we're going to click on miscellaneous. And then we're going to scroll down a little bit to where it says rotate minimap. And you want to make sure that the setting is actually off at all times. Now, the reason why we do this is because if you look at the top right at your minimap, whenever you turn your character, you can see that north is always north, east is always east, same with south, and then west. But if you actually have the setting on, what really winds up happening is you're basically always facing north, as you can see. So it's really, really important to have the setting off because if your shot caller calls to hit east or west or wherever, uh, it's going to be really, really confusing if your camera or if your map angle is always showing you at north. So make sure this is turned off, guys, and uh, it'll save you a lot of trouble, trust me. The next setting that I want to talk about, guys, is of course going to be the stacked HP bar. So um, this is mostly preference. I really believe it to be a little bit of an advantage. If you go into your settings wheel and you go into show hide, you see we have here show stacked HP bar. What this basically means is that whenever you hit an enemy with an ability, you will actually see a visual indication of what thousandth of HP they're on. So if I hit somebody and they're at times eight, I know that they have 8,000 HP. And in the same example, if we see I have 7,007 HP here, if somebody hits me for let's say one damage, it's gonna show times seven. Um, so you have a little bit more of an accurate representation of what somebody's HP is at, what show stacked HP bar. I'm going to let you select targets a little bit faster because you can quickly pick out who's low. Really, really good setting that I honestly recommend for Node War. I personally like it. I know some people don't use it. It's perfectly fine. Also, you can choose to turn names off. This is something that I really like doing in large scale PvP. I like to turn off party member names so I don't see the names of my platoon and show guild, clan, or alliance member names. I also like to turn this off, so that way I can't see anybody else in another platoon, or let's say, for example, you're doing siege. This is really, really nice, because otherwise you're gonna see so many people on the screen, and to be completely honest, um, unless you're shot calling or healing, you don't really need to see, you know, 40 to 50 to 60, however many people on the screen at once, unless they're enemies. So give it a shot. It'll give you some extra visual clarity. It's really good. I personally like it. And uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think about that next settings I would like to talk about are going to be full screen and crop mode. So if we hit escape and go to our settings, go to display settings, and as you can see here we have full screen, full screen window, and game window. Ideally for all forms of PvP, whether it's battle arena or node war or siege, you want to make sure that you're always in full screen. The reason for this is because you get more FPS when you're in full screen, and you can also bypass the FPS cap of 144. So you are not going to get really, really high frames unless you're in full screen. Full screen window is okay if you're doing like, you know, PvE or other small things, but otherwise for any kind of PvP content, make sure you're in full screen for more FPS. The other setting, guys, is going to be crop mode. So crop mode is basically what you see here with these kind of gray boxes. Essentially what this does is it crops a little bit of your screen and it gives you a little bit more of a compact, tighter view and apparently it helps out with performance by a tiny bit, which I'm not 100% sure of. But uh, yeah, you just go here to crop mode, make sure this is enabled. And the display width and display height pretty much controls how these gray bars are going to co uh, come out. So if we lower that a little bit, you can see it kind of it kind of boxes it in a little bit more. So you guys can mess around with it and see how much you enjoy. I don't really necessarily like my entire screen being filled up by the gray bars, so I uh, tend to keep it a little bit minimal. But um, yeah, pretty good setting. Let me know what you guys think about that. 
After that, guys, I want to talk a little bit about some different UI elements that you can turn off to give you a little bit of extra performance and a little bit of visual clarity. So if we hit escape and we go over here to edit UI. Now, 80% of these things you don't necessarily need to have on during Node War, but some of them are outright useless like game tips. But starting from the top left, we're going to turn off family buff and the point information right here. Uh, during a node war, you don't really need to see that you have Agris or that you're level 63 or 64 or whatever it is. It pretty much is just extra clutter, so we can turn that off. Over on the top right, where it says location and time information, we can also turn this off. We don't necessarily need to see what time it is in-game or what server we're on, because, well, you pretty much already know what server you're on anyway, so that doesn't really matter. You can also turn off main quest and the quest widget. Unless you're questing, you don't really need these on, so I generally keep this off for a majority of the time. On the bottom right, it's a little bit hard to see, but where it says menu button, this widget here basically shows you the Dark Rift icon, the Pearl Shot button, your friend icon, etc, etc. You don't really need to see this during a node war, so I like to keep this off as well. Over on the bottom left, we have arguably the least important thing i don't even know why this still exists but it's called game tips and this will pretty much just pop up with like a sliding message over and over and over telling you about some extremely interesting thing about bdo um, and it's really not useful at all so uh, make sure that this is turned off <laughs> or it's just going to be there doing nothing aside from that guys we want to make sure that we have our cooldown slot set up so you don't necessarily have to do your cooldowns the way that i do everybody has their own thing either you have them vertically lined up on the side of your character or maybe in like a box or two on the bottom. It doesn't really matter how you do it, but the whole point is that you want some kind of cooldown slots so you can see when your abilities are actually coming off cooldown. Make sure that these are, you know, however many you need, set them up, set it up in your skill menu, and make sure that's good to go, because otherwise it's gonna be a little bit complicated to play, not knowing exactly if you have like one second off of your biggest ability or like how long is your e-buff, you know, something like that. So make sure that these are being tracked and it will help you out big time during war. Also do make sure that you have your buff list turned on so you can see the different buffs that you have in your character, whether it's church, food, etc. And make sure that you guys have your chat boxes on so that way you can see your chat. And if you have a separate chat box for your kill feed, which we'll go over in a second, make sure you have these on so you can see important information or your kill feed. The final UI setting that I would like to talk about is actually going to be an additional chat box. So normally speaking, we have a bunch of different chat boxes here. We have chat 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Um, what I like to do is I like to go to separate chat window and split a second chat box like this. Now what you can do here is click on the cog wheel and then you want to turn every single setting off except combat, system, and private item and you can also turn on header and turn on show chat timestamp so what this does is whenever you get a kill or a death in node war it'll pop up in a nice little chat box like this so you can see if you get a, a blue feed you know if you're winning the fight you'll see if you get a red feed if you're losing the fight um, and it pretty much just helps you get a little bit of extra information on what's going on so you know that if you see a bunch of reds you know that you're losing the fight and you probably should pull out if you see a really big blue feed, you know that you're probably winning the fight. Um, it's really good to see. It's really helpful to have. So definitely something to consider if you want an additional kill feed on your screen. Okay, guys. So before I actually talk about what each annex does specifically, I want to quickly talk about how you can buy annexes and how you can buy a fort in case you are the one actually building out your base. So first things first, we want to come over here to any guild military supply manager. So for example, I'm going to go to Paula. She's basically right next to the main Heidel storage, as you can see. We're going to go talk to Paula. We're going to select the Guild Military Supply option. And if you scroll all the way to the very bottom, you can actually see that you can purchase the Node and Conquest War Annex Assembly Tools for 1 million silver each. Now, this 1 million silver actually comes from your total guild funds. It doesn't actually come from your personal silver, so you don't have to worry about wasting any money. And essentially, each one of these toolkits is basically one annex. So if you want to buy five barricades, you need to buy five of these. If you want to place two flame towers, you have to buy two of these. 
if you want to play Sirico, you have to buy one of these. So essentially each one of these is going to be its own separate annex and you can choose whichever one you want when you actually right click it and enter the menu. Now for any normal reasonable node war, if you're building a base, I would say you would want around maybe 15 to 20 of these for any normal size base, depending on the cap that you're on. And of course you might mess up, you might need to place additional barricades, you might need to rip a flame tower because you can put it in a different position, etc, etc. So if you are the one responsible for building your base, obviously the first thing you want to do is you want to buy your fort for whatever tier node war you're on. So of course if you're on a T1 node war, you want to buy a T1 fort, T2, buy a T2 fort, and so on and so forth. After you buy your fort and you actually place your fort in the node war zone, then you can start using the annex assembly kits to place down your annexes. So in the next section, I'm going to be talking about what each annex does specifically. But long story short, you buy your fort, you place your fort down in the node war zone, and then you buy a bunch of these so that way you can actually place annexes. And the way you place them is very, very simple. You literally just right click it in your bag and you choose any blue peg. There's going to be like a grid that pops up similar to when you place traps. You choose any blue peg. That means that you can actually place something there and you basically just place down whatever you want for whatever base you want to make. Okay guys, so for the next section, I want to talk a little bit about defense annexes very briefly. So the first annex that we have, it's not really necessarily an annex, but I guess it is, is going to be your square forts. So your square fort is basically your stick. This is pretty much your base. Uh, if this gets a zero, then you are out of the node war. So throughout any node war, the main objective, of course, is to bring the enemy's fort to zero HP. Uh, of course, the ways that you can do this are by cannon fire. Cannons will get it to 50% HP. They will not get the fort lower than 50% HP. Uh, any normal damage actually does damage to forts. So any of your abilities, horse charges, elephants, um, they all do decent damage to forts. But mainly you're going to be killing forts by just normal damage and axes. Uh, you can also, of course, tap the fort using polished stone, which we spoke about a little bit earlier. And uh, yeah, honestly, very, very simple. Don't let your fort die or you will lose. The next defense annex that we have up, guys, are going to be barricades. So everybody's seen barricades. There are these things right here. And pretty much what these do is these just basically block off pathways. So if you're approaching the space right here, you see that if you want to go from this side, well, you can't really do that because it's fully barricaded. So you have to jump over onto this rock, get hit by an FT. So barricades are basically just soft blockers. Um, they pretty much cut off pathways. They also help to eat a little bit of damage. There are a lot of classes that can hit over barricades, however. So like, let's say I go up to this base and I'm shooting damage over the barricades. There are certain abilities that will straight up hit over them. So it's not necessarily a perfect means of protection versus other players, uh, but it does help out a whole lot. Um, they're also very, very desinky. So you see how the spikes are faced inwards into our base. If you have the barricades placed like that and you come in from the opposite side, so if I'm an enemy and I'm running up to this base and I run into the barricade right here, it's actually going to magnetize you onto the barricade in a way. It's very, very laggy. It's very desinky. So barricades also kind of create this like web of like weird spaghetti code where you just get stuck for no reason. So really, really good stuff. You can have on a lot of barricades on any kind of base. So it's really good to fill out empty spaces. Uh, it's really good to create natural cover like this. As you can see, like if these barricades weren't here, you'd be able to just walk right into the base. So uh, very good to soak up damage. Very good to block out space. And yeah, use them wherever you can. So the next most important annex that we're going to talk about is going to be the flag factory. Flag Factory is really, really good because this allows you to take out a flag and put it almost anywhere within the node war zone. And it essentially just acts like a mobile respawn beacon, which is really, really, really powerful. Um, especially if you use it properly and you're trying to, let's say, you're trying to go full pressure onto a base, but the enemy base is so far across the node. You know, you have to run two to three minutes or whatever to get across the node, or it's just really bad terrain. You just put down a flag and you can spawn super duper close to an enemy base. So it's a really, really good uh, annex to have for every single node war. And good flag placements are really going to be the determining factor between you having good offensive pressure onto a guild or not. And the way this works is that basically when the node war starts, you're going to walk up to the actual flag factory. You're going to hit R on it. And it's going to start baking up the flag. And I believe after 
I think it's 10 minutes. I could be wrong on that. I have to check. But I think it's 10 minutes. The flag will bake up. And then somebody can actually take the flag out. And have it in their inventory. And then once they take the flag out. You can start baking another flag. So you can actually just have flags queued up. And have them baked up in your uh, inventory. So really really good annex you want to make sure that as soon as war starts you have this baking up and you want to have as many flags as possible because uh, they do take several minutes to actually complete baking um, so yeah make sure you guys have your flags make sure you start it as soon as war is live and uh, you should be good to go so the next most arguably most important annex is going to be the supply depot so everybody already knows what supply depot is uh, what it does is it does quite a bit of things actually so at any point during the war you can come up to the supply depot and you can hit R to interact with it and you can basically repair your gear here um, you can take your horse out you can buy new traps from the supply depot so if you need to restock on your traps you can also buy other annexes so let's say your uh, your Rico dies or your flame tower dies you can actually buy more of them from the supply depot you can buy potions um, you can do a lot of things with this. So if the supply depot goes down, it's actually really, really important because you won't be able to get your horse out. So if your horse dies and your supply depot is also dead, you're going to have to go out of your way to get to a stable keeper to get a new horse. Honestly, probably the most important annex along with Ricos and Flame Towers, which we'll talk about in a bit. But yeah, it basically does everything. If you need your gear repaired, you need a new horse, potions, annexes, traps... Uh, you can do that literally all in this one structure right here. So this is super duper important to have up. Make sure this is always up for every single node war. If this goes down and you guys don't have your horses, you're going to lose a lot of offensive pressure. So want to keep this up pretty much 100% of the time. It's super duper good. So another really big defense annex that we have here, guys, is going to be the recovery sensor. So now recovery centers are pretty basic. And essentially what they do is for each recovery sensor that you have up on the field, this is going to reduce your current total respawn timer by 6 seconds for each one, but your timer cannot be reduced below 10 seconds naturally. So pretty much the more you have these on the field, the lower your spawn timer is going to be throughout the war. Um, of course, the spawn timers naturally increase with every death, and they also increase the longer the war goes on. So having up Rico sensors is very, very important, because if not, you're going to wind up having extremely long spawn timers. and this is going to be the difference between you getting killed in one pump or not. Because you'll see a lot of times you go onto a base, you burn their Ricos, you burn their supply depot, whatever. You really want to kill these Ricos because, again, that's going to put the enemy on a longer spawn timer. If they're on a longer spawn timer, you have enough time to burn the rest of their base and get other structures. Uh, so these are honestly like super, super important. You want to make sure that these are always up all the time. Um, there's also a little bit of technology with them. Apparently, if they are in the process of rebuilding they also count towards the spawn timer reduction. I don't know exactly how true that is, but I do think it is true. So as long as you have this up at any point in time, even if it's a rebuilding, it's gonna have huge, huge value. So make sure that these are always down on the field. Next in line, guys, is going to be the Cannon Observatory. Now, Cannon Obs is a pretty interesting one. This basically, much like the Flag Factory, allows you to essentially bake up a cannon it's going to take about five minutes for the process to actually go through. And the way this works is that you essentially bake up the cannon, you take out the cannon, and much like a trap or much like a flag, uh, you can put it down somewhere in the node war area. Unfortunately, with cannons, you can put them in really ridiculous spots, like some really weird vertical high ground. And you basically have a guy sit on the cannon, and this pretty much acts as like a long range, big burst of damage. Um, I'm not going to get into crazy detail about how cannon works or what cannon does, but essentially what you do with this is somebody takes it out, you have your cannoneer take it out, and you place it in a really, really annoying location, <laughs> like for example that tower that's all the way over there in that distance, and that guy can basically dial down on a base and essentially just shoot at a base and do massive damage to every single structure or anything that you hit from basically across the map. Uh, it's really, really pesky, it's super duper annoying, but it's also super good because it's one of the few ways that you can actually assault a base without ever actually being on the base, right? So if you're fighting a really, really strong guild and you know that you cannot beat them whatsoever, you can still cannon their base uh, and eventually all their structures are going to take free damage, their stick is going to take free damage. Not only that, while you are getting cannoned, you can't actively tap your fort to recover your fort. So 
If you're under really, really big cannon pressure and your flex team is not trying to alleviate the threat, it's going to be basically almost impossible to tap your fort unless you have a 20 second tap timer. And even then, if you have double cannons on you, it's going to be pretty jover. So uh, yeah, cannons are super annoying. However, you need a good cannoneer. And yeah, that's basically what those do. Okay, guys, so second to last annex that we have here is, of course, going to be the wooden fence gates. So there's not really a whole lot of things to say about the wooden fence gate. You can pretty much think of this as the big brother to the barricade. It doesn't really do anything special except block a really, really big chunk of space. And it is extremely, extremely tanky. Like, on a normal node war, the gate is pretty much never going to die. The only way this is going to die is if you send, like, an elephant onto it in T1 and T2. There are no elephants, so where you place the gate is very, very important for the base. It's kind of like the anchor of the base. So you want to kind of set this up around some kind of natural terrain. Uh, so you see here we have it set up with the barricades that the only entry or exit point from the gate side is right here. So you can create really, really big natural choke points with the gate. You can also open the gate if you are in the actual guild that put it down. So if you go up to the gate and I think it's either R or F5, um, you can actually open the gate. Now, typically speaking, you don't really want to do this in the middle of a crazy war, because what's going to happen is you open the gate, and any enemies that are around are going to be able to just swarm your base. So you don't really want to open your gate. This is especially important for Siege, um, because if the timing is bad, you're going to let people just run into your base for free, instead of having to go around all these barricades. So yeah, nothing really special about the gate. It blocks a lot of space. It is practically invincible, and um, yeah, it's pretty annoying. Finally, we have the good old flame tower. So everybody knows what this is. Everybody has seen it. Uh, the flame tower is a really, really annoying structure that pretty much just shoots out a burst of big ass flames on like a 180 degree angle like that. But the thing about the flame tower is that the radius is pretty deceptive because not only does it hit in a 180 degree angle, but it also hits a little bit behind the FT. So realistically speaking, if you're anywhere in like this little like this circular area, you're probably going to get hit by the FT if you're too close to it. It is extremely annoying. It does pretty respectable damage. The CC from the flame tower, like the little bit of the knockback, actually negates any kind of super armor or protection uh, except iframe. So if you're trying to, you know, live inside of a base and you're doing a bunch of super armor abilities, you're still going to get CC'd by the flame tower, which can actually open you up to be CC'd by a normal hit. So it's super, super annoying. It also hits through basically everything. So it's going to hit through barricades. It's going to hit through the gate. It can even hit through walls, to be completely honest with you. It can hit through walls and whatnot. So really, really disgusting annex. A couple things to note about it as well is that if you're inside of a base, sieging a base, you can actually get back attacks on the flame tower right here. So if you see this little wooden backpack thing where the person actually goes into the flame tower, if you're actually doing damage onto this side of the FT, you can score back attacks and kill it even faster. So it's really, really helpful if you have the chance to actually do that. Otherwise, I would be really, really careful ever fighting around the FT because again, the AOE is just so astronomically big that even if you're around like here, you're still gonna get hit. Like the AOE is insanely, insanely big. Um, so yeah, definitely be really careful with this. The FT is probably one of the most, if not the most important offensive structure that you could possibly build. Mostly due to the fact that these protect your base from just getting one pumped. You know, if you ever want to go for like an axe push or if you're ever burning a base, if there's somebody in that FT right there or in any FT, there is no possible way that you're going to burn a base with people in the actual FT. So these have to die before you commit to like a really big burn or at least one of them have to die and then everybody stands on the opposite side so they don't get hit by the uh, other FT. So yeah, pretty much the most powerful defense annex on its own. You know, you have somebody manually pilot this, you basically get inside with the R button and you spam your space bar, watch some anime and you're good to go. Of course you need FT fuel, which you can also buy from the supply depot. You can also buy from a supply military manager. Super annoying structure, uh, nerf FTs, thank you PA. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for FTs. Alrighty guys, so very briefly, I wasn't actually going to include this in my video because Elephant Nursery and Hwasha are now only available for T4 and Siege. However, I thought since this is an overall Captain Node War 
guide video that it'd be good to include it anyway. So let's talk about the Elephant Nursery. Now, the Elephant Nursery, guys, much like the Flag Factory and the Cannons, uh, essentially lets you bake up a little bit of an elephant. Now, what this does is it takes 10 minutes for your elephant to finish baking up. Then you can take the elephant out, and this thing is actually a blight nowadays, guys. If you have fought any kind of elephant ever, you know how annoying this thing is. I mean, you, you take it out, it's huge, it has a massive HP bar, so your entire ball has to dogpile it if they want to kill it. Uh, it's got a little bit of a stampede move with charge, which you can run through balls and just CC them as you're running through them. It also has a stomp, which is a massive, massive AoE, uh, pretty much AoE CC. It's really, really disgusting. And pretty much the main purpose of elephants are just to destroy every single structure with ease. Uh, do you need a wall to go down? No problem, just send the elephant at it. You need a bunch of barricades to die? No problem, just send the elephant. You know, so it's like the ultimate structure busting kind of annex. And it also is super duper good at disrupting enemy balls. So if you play T4 or if you play Cap Siege, the elephant is one of the most annoying and one of the most powerful things that you can possibly use. Of course, it does require somebody to actually be riding it. It is not automated, so you will have to have a designated elephant rider. But otherwise, if you do have one of these guys on T4 and Siege, because again, they are not available on T1, T2, or T3, this elephant thingy is just, it's absurd. Uh, if you guys know, you know. Uh, give it a shot in your T4 or Sieges, and let me know what you think about the elephant. The other annex that I would like to talk about, guys, that again is exclusive to only T4, Siege, and Uncapped these days, is of course going to be the Huacha. So the Huacha, guys, this structure never used to be as popular as it is today because it was just kind of one of those things where if you used it, you know, if you had it, you'd use it. But nowadays, these things are absolutely disgusting, especially on Siege. If you have somebody sitting in your Huacha on Siege, guys, they are probably going to get Stormtrooper, let's be honest. So the reason why these are so good is because they have basically two forms of shooting, if I'm not mistaken. They have your standard one-shot big burst. Uh, it's pretty much like a miniature little carpet bomb. You kind of get in the Huacha, and you have like a really big arcing shot, and you can shoot over siege walls, as you can see, like over here. So with the Huacha, usually what you do is if somebody is sieging your base, uh, especially on siege again, you essentially just shoot the Huacha wherever they're trying to axe or wherever they're grouped up, and if you hit that big Huacha shot, they're probably going to die in one hit. So the thing about Huacha, again, is that the other alternate fire mode is like a three-shot burst. And pretty much the three-shot burst does so much unbelievable damage that, again, if you get hit by it, you're going to get stunned immediately. Like, you're going to get CC'd, and every single shot is going to CC you. So unless your ball is actively healing you and you have casters you are probably going to die if you get hit by the three-shot burst. Like, if you get hit by that thing, you need to V, or you need to have some kind of insane healing, or you're just going to die. Um, that's basically just how it works. So, <laughs> they're pretty much a very wide-ranged, massive AoE CC damaging tool. Uh, it's a pretty fun annex to use as well. Like, it's pretty simple, and it's also very, very tanky. So, yeah, if you guys do any T4, or Uncapped, or Siege, this annex is actually disgusting. It's really, really good. So make sure you guys always have somebody in this, especially for Siege. Um, it will definitely win you some wars. Alrighty, guys. Without taking up too much more of your time, I just would like to say thank you guys so much for watching my Node War setup guide. I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope it helps somebody out. And if there's anything you would like to see in a potentially future video, definitely do let me know down below in the comments. And I'll definitely have links to my guide and my stream in the description below. So, uh, yeah, if you guys enjoyed the video, man, please consider dropping a like and dropping a sub. Appreciate you guys so much, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.